Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is having an amazing day. My name is Felicia, and I am co-president of Project Tech Conferences Vancouver, or you can say PTC Vancouver as an acronym. On behalf of the executive team, we appreciate each and everyone's attendance at PTC Vancouver's Visualize This. We organize a variety of interactive talks and workshops. To fam familiarize yourselves with the schedule, today's conference will start with our first workshop led by Ren Lang with an interval of our panel discussion afterwards. After the panel, we will have our first keynote session. Promptly at 2.30, we will have our short break and games where you can win prizes. We will end the first day featuring our second workshop and have a discussion as well as prizes. So make sure to stay at the very end. Before we begin, we strongly encourage you all to participate as much as possible, whenever possible. This fosters an engaging community and creates interesting conversations. After discussions, feel free to react with a virtual applause and thumbs up. However, to reduce distractions and background noise, we do ask that you remain muted when you're not talking or when others are speaking. At any point, if you come across any technical difficulties, feel free to message us on our Instagram at PTC Vancouver or email us at Vancouver at projecttechconferences.com. Now, we, want, we welcome you into our spring conference on UI UX design, and we hope that by the end of the conference, you'll have a greater knowledge of UI UX design, as well as the social impacts of technology. Before we dive into all the amazing speakers and workshops planned for today, I'll be talking a little bit about PTC. PTC was founded in Ontario in 2019 by a group of youth excited to spread accessible tech events for high school and university students. Starting off with conferences, we have now expanded to a wide variety of different programming like webinars, hackathons, coding challenges, and other media like a blog and a podcast. Not only has the variety of ways to engage with cool tech topics expanded, so has the reach with branches in Ottawa, Toronto, Waterloo, PEI, and Vancouver, all with the goal of creating a fun and engaging way to learn about tech outside of school. And before we begin, we do have some polls just to get us started. So feel free to answer them. Yeah, just a few more seconds. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like the majority of us are in grade 11 or post-secondary and uh, workshops. Workshops definitely the most, the most uh, people are most excited about it and Hopefully by the end of today, you'll be, you'll turn that maybe into a yes for, are you interested in a career in web development? Okay, I'll turn it into, over to Felicia. Yeah, so thank you, Ethan. Now we'll move on to our first workshop of the afternoon hosted by Ren Lang. Ren is a third year computer science student at UBC and is part of UBC Launchpad a student-run software engineering club. Since then, he's entered as a software developer at various companies and works on projects in his free time. Without further ado, I'll pass this session over to Ren. Thanks, Felicia. I'm just gonna share my screen for presentation, if that's okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks Felicia for the introduction. Um, so yeah, hope everyone's having a good Saturday. Um, today I'll be giving you a quick workshop on UI UX design and more specifically how um, kind of design principles influence software development and how, you know, like the assets and the designs that we actually create get turned into, into front end code. So 
a bit more about myself first. Um, so like Felicia said, um, my name is Ren and I go to UBC. I'm going into my fourth year in September um, in computer engineering. And my, uh, my start into, I guess, the tech industry was actually pretty late. Um, I first started um, in university actually after my first programming course and I was really interested um, and I had really had a good time um, in that class. So I decided after that, I wanted to keep learning. So I basically um, started learning how to build iOS apps on my own um, just for fun. And then that turned into me joining Launchpad, um, which as Felicia said, was a, or is a software engineering uh, design team at UBC. And basically we kind of um, recruit teams of designers and developers and, and we build apps together. And over the last couple of years, I've been um, an iOS developer on the team. Uh, last year, I was a tech lead and uh, just recently started as co-pres of the club. And outside of school, um, I've interned at Orbis Investments, which is an investment management company in, in Vancouver doing um, software development. And right now, I'm currently at Demonware, um, which is a subsidiary of Activision Blizzard. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are gamers, um, but um, basically, we kind of work on the networking code for Call of Duty. So that's been pretty exciting. Um, and then fun fact about myself, I guess I'm originally from Calgary. So I really like a bunch of outdoor activities, such as, you know, hiking, camping and snowboarding in the winter. So quick overview on today's workshop. Um, First, we'll go over some kind of basics on UI UX. So we'll talk about the design process, what the different stages are, and um, kind of some, some common terms that, that are, are found in, in the industry. Then we'll work through a sample like scenario um, and, and we'll kind of go through that design process that we just talked about. And then we'll look at an actual example app and, and kind of I'll show you guys the front end code and how um, those designs actually get turned into, into a real app. And then lastly, we'll um, kind of have a retrospective on what we've learned today and then talk about kind of where you can go from here, where your interests lie, that sort of stuff. So yeah, um, some of you might've heard of the UX uh, UI design process already, but it's basically like a, a framework or a guideline um, on how to research um, design problems and how to come up with solutions. Um, so here, I don't know if, if people have, have seen this before, um, but this is just a very simple diagram of kind of outlining the five stages. Um, and, and we'll talk a bit more about what happens at each stage. Uh, what, what's the point of each stage? Like, what are we trying to achieve? And then lastly, at the end, I'll ask you guys um, where, where you think kind of the design turns into development or as we usually call like dev handoff where designers hand off the design to developers. So first for research, um, that's basically to understand the problem. Um, before we start designing anything and before we kind of try to figure out what platform we wanna use, um, like what kind of app we wanna make, we first have to nail down what problem are we trying to solve. So that's what research is all about. And what does that consist of? Well, there's kind of, um, many ways you can do this. Um, you can start by kind of just reading articles or kind of doing research online. Um, a common way is to send out surveys to your friends and your family. If you're trying to solve like a common pain point uh, amongst people that have similar lifestyle as you. Um, and then a further extension of that is commonly we hold one-on-one -on -one interviews with um, kind of users um, or prospective users and to try and understand their needs better. So, all of that gets aggregated and then we have a bunch of data um, about what problem we're trying to solve and what do people want? What do people need? What are their motivations? And then from there, we go to part two, um, which is the planning phase. And this is where um, basically you come up with ideas. And ideas, um, this, this kind of stage of coming up with ideas, bouncing back and forth, uh, how we wanna solve the problem that we've just researched, um, that's commonly known as ideation. Um, yeah, it's basically at a high level, how, like, how do we want to solve the problem? And another thing that happens at this planning process um, is once you kind of um, 
come up with your ideas, you also have to nail down what um, your MVP will look like. And MVP stands for minimum viable product, which is basically um, like the most bare bones um, features and, and um, core functionality of your app that is needed to kind of beat your app. So you need to nail down, you need to plan out like what features you definitely need and that make your app. And then part three, we go to design. Um, and this is where we start the actual kind of common design principles and, and, and things you hear about design, such as kind of creating user flow, um, um, wireframing. This is usually kind of lo-fi wireframing um, and then making important decisions um, about like the direction of the app that you want to go. So once you've kind of figured out this structure and, and the flow of the app, which is kind of where we want to be um, after the design process, um, sorry, the design stage, um, then we go to prototyping. Um, and an important distinction to make between these two is, um, although it's this design, des the design stage isn't for you to kind of figure out exactly how your app is supposed to look and like, exactly um, which assets you want to use, like which pictures and really high detail drawings. It's really the stage where you're just creating um, the core kind of, or the major beats of your app, the, um, the essential parts. So extending on your MVP features, now you're kind of fleshing out those MVP features. And then after you do that, then you go to prototyping. And prototyping is where kind of, you start actually designing things, you know, you start drawing out um, pictures and um, icons and you start laying out views in more detail. And this would be kind of what's known as like mid to high fi wireframes. Um, and then of course, asset creation, which is like going into Photoshop or um, Illustrator and, and actually creating um, images. And then from there, it kind of, you continually iterate, you go um, test on your users, see if, the thing that you've created is kind of addressing the problem. Um, what feedback do they have? And then you kind of keep going back and through this loop of continually improving. And that at a high level is kind of what the design process is telling us. It's so you first, you understand the problem and then you come up with what you think is the solution. And then you test to see if that works. And then you kind of keep going in this loop and hopefully your product gets better and better over time. So, Having explained these five um, stages, where do you think the developers come in? Or where, where do you think the designers collaborate with um, the, the software developers? And, and when does kind of coding happen? Um, I don't know if I can see hands or, um, so if anyone wants to answer, feel free to just unmute yourself. Would it be the, between design and prototype? Yeah, so um, those two are really important parts of um, the collaboration between devs and designers. Um, but it's actually throughout the whole process. Like uh, commonly people think, okay, it's when you know there's actual assets or actual designs that need to be created. And that's when um, designers collaborate. But actually it's really, throughout the whole process, even from the research and planning stages, because um, an important part of software development isn't only the front end or like implementing the designs. We also want to figure out the core functionality of our app and to build the architecture around that. So the design and the prototyping stages are definitely where the most kind of back and forth happens. And I would actually say the design stage is probably the most important stage because the lo-fi wireframes kind of dictate where the app goes um, and what kind of views and what kind of structures we want to build. So I guess kind of trick question, I guess dev handoff we usually say is kind of um, when we have kind of wireframes that we hand over to devs and they start developing, but the actual collaboration process is throughout the entire um, five stages. So now um, let's go into today's example. Uh, 
Uh, okay, hold on. Slides being a bit slow. Um, but yeah, so we'll basically walk through these um, five stages together um, through an example. Um, so I've created um, a, a kind of example app and we're gonna walk through how we're gonna design it. So stage one, we're trying to do our research. Um, let's just pretend that we've conducted our interviews and, and um, sent out surveys and we've come up with this user persona, which is basically like a story, like a, we have a sample user that we wanna um, solve their problems. So here we have, um, today we're gonna be making a charades app basically. So let's just say Steve wants to play charades with his family. So that's his goal. To achieve this goal, like what are his needs? What does he definitely need? Why is he wanting to do this? And what are his pain points? So to think about this, um, we basically need to um, figure out those three things, the needs, the motivations, and the pain points. So what do you, what do you guys think um, for Steve? What, what are his needs, motivations, and pain points? So I'll help you guys out for, for a start. So for his needs, it's pretty simple. Basically he wants, he needs to host a game of charades. So what happens in charades, um, if you're not familiar, basically one person is trying to act out a word and the other people are trying to guess what the word is without looking at the word and the person can't say anything. So essentially he wants to host this game of charades. So that's his need. Can you guys think about maybe what his motivations be and perhaps what, a, what, what pain points? Um, hosting a game of charades would, would, would kind of entail. Okay, so um, I'll give you guys a hint, I guess. Um, in terms of motivation, um, that I guess is pretty subjective as well, that he wants to basically um, play this game with his family. Um, and he, because we're, we're in the framework of designing an app, let's say, he doesn't want to, he, he's, he's, he doesn't want to create like cards by hand, because that would take a really long time, right? So I guess from motivational standpoint, he is not a business user, it's just casual. So, um, you know, he's, it, we're not creating like a client application or anything. It's just a very kind of casual, um, gets the job done kind of thing is okay. And then in terms of pain point, well, um, let's say if you wanna play, if you've ever played charades, um, at least for me, one of the things is if you buy a set of cards, those are the cues, right? So you, you're not, if, if there's fun ideas or you come up with something new, you can't really change that unless you go and create your own cards, which we had already mentioned is takes a lot of time and it's a lot of pain. So those are kind of the pain points that we want to solve. So, um, ideally after you've done your research, um, with, with interviewing and surveys, you kind of have a general idea of what you want to do uh, and what problems you want to solve. So for us, that's, we want to make an app that basically you can play a game of charades with all the rules that are included in that. Um, and the pain points we're trying to solve is that we don't want to make you cards by hands and we want it to be customizable. So it's not the same words every time. So going from here, um, we kind of have to plan out our core features in our MVP. Um, and basically um, in a game of charades, uh, we just nail down what, what definitely does the app need to do. Um, and notice how we're only focusing on a couple and that's why MVP minimum viable product, it's like the minimum requirements needed for the app to function. So we're not trying to figure out what we want our app to have or what its competitive advantages are gonna be or any of that. It's just nailing down what we absolutely need or else the app wouldn't be the app without them. So for one, basically 
you know, we have to create our own cues and words and the app has to be able to keep track of those. We have to basically choose words at random or else it wouldn't be much of a charades app um, and people would be able to guess after playing the first time. And we have to display it on the screen. And then lastly, we wanna keep track of which words have been guessed correctly. So after someone's done a word, if someone chooses the same category again, we don't want you know, the randomizer choosing the same word again and then things get boring over time. So now onto um, the designs. Now that we have our user persona in mind and we've kind of nailed down our MVP features, we want to actually start designing the app. So there's many tools you can use for this. Um, the popular ones are usually Figma, uh, Adobe Illustrator, and Sketch. Um, but also an important one is, especially for people starting out and for people that don't have a UI UX, um, intensive background like myself, where I'm coming from software engineering, don't discount just good old whiteboarding or just using a pen and paper. There's way less overhead to that. You don't have to learn as many skills to get started. And um, it's quick to iterate. It's quick to improve and, and change and, and uh, talk about new ideas. So here, basically, I've just created um, a really simple lo-fi wireframe um, for our app, um, kind of going along the core MVP features, basically. We want to show the word um, on the screen kind of like this. Um, we want to be able to choose a random word. And then we have some sort of user mechanism to say whether they guessed the word correct. And if they did, then we don't want to keep using that word. And we want to keep track of that, that word has been guessed. So now we fast forward a bit um, in going through um, iterations and basically you now this is the design process where you actually come up with um, the the assets and you want to figure out okay exactly how do we want to make it and you can see from lo-fi to kind of more high fidelity you start to have icons and colors and specific layout as opposed to just you know the bare bones and this is an important distinction is that you don't want to be making these decisions back here because the last thing you want to do is design something that doesn't end up in the app or make expensive decisions early that aren't always the best. So and that's why we spend so long on these lo-fi wireframes and building out the um, core features as, and, and then focusing later on fleshing those out. So we fast forward a bit to the high-fi wireframes. This is an example um, app, like I said, that I, I, I did for fun before. Um, so here, it's actually an app that I made for my family. Um, and another, I guess, kind of bonus feature was that I wanted it to be bilingual because some family members weren't as familiar with English. Um, so we have this kind of design now and we have the wireframes down. How do we get that into real code? So now I'm gonna switch out from the slides and I'm gonna show you guys the actual code. Um, and then at any point, it, it's probably gonna be a lot and I know not everyone has the software background. So just stop me if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions. Um, yeah, so I'm going to switch over here. Um, can everyone see this, by the way? Did I switch over to like a code editor? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So here's our simulator. Um, and basically, um, all these files here are um, the views and the controllers. So the views are kind of what we're interested in. And that's how we actually turn the designs into um, a running app. And then the controllers um, are kind of more on the software engineering side where you kind of figure out, okay, what does a button press do? Um, where do we want um, you know, certain things to happen such as making a network request or stuff like that. Um, so let's take a look quickly first at this controller. Um, we have a table view, which is basically a list. Um, and this is the list that you see here. And you can see that basically, depending on which row we're in, we choose a different icon and we choose different word. So we have basically 
an array or a list of topics in English and in Chinese, and we set those to the labels. And here you can see that um, we're basically choosing images. Um, and uh, you might be wondering where these names come from. Um, and this, they're just part of the project in, in this assets folder. And basically you can see here that we have, you know, action-icon, culture-icon. And those correspond to these names here. So here we basically defining um, in row zero, one, two, three, what icons we want. And in this is basically the row number, which row number um, we want, which topics. So we have the data now in our, um, in each cell. And but how do we lay it out, right? Like how, how do we make this look the way it is? And how do we move things around or, um, those things happen in the view. And here we have the basic topic select controller, and then we have the table view cell. And here you can see kind of the three things. We have our image, which is what we were setting earlier to the name of the icons. And then we have our English label and our Chinese label. So these define basically what, um, each of those components are. And then down here, we basically set up the constraints. And the constraints are essentially, sorry, I don't know why the colors aren't filling in, um, being, being a bit slow, but basically, yeah, you can see it, it might be a bit hard to read, um, but so for the topic image, we want um, its center Y anchor, which means just where we want it to be centered in the middle to be that of its parent, right? And then we want the left of the image to be the left of the cell. And then we want it spaced for 40. Um, and that those 40 pixels would be this right here. And I'm just gonna go quick example. Like if I shift this to let's say 80 and we restart the app. This will take a minute, it just has to rebuild and download it onto your simulator. And you can see that it's moved over by 40 more pixels, right? So this is how kind of if, if in Figma or, or Illustrator that you design a view and we specify how many pixels, how big things are, this is how it actually gets turned into code. We basically specify um, these constraints. You can say, say the height and the width and they can be relative to each other. So here you can see the English label, its left anchor is tied to the image's right anchor. So when this moved over, so did this. We can of course set it to not do that. And then the two would just overlay like that. And sometimes that's what we want. But for the sake of demo, I'm just gonna switch that back to 40. And then um, we can change a couple other things in the app. Um, so let's say, our designers have created new icons and we wanna change these icons, right? So how would we do that? Well, going back to here, we see that for the case zero to four, we've, we're, we're passing in the names and I've um, showed you guys the assets folder and I've just thrown in some random images, okay? They're just like, literally like, it's just food. Um, but if, let's say we wanna switch these kind of black and white icons into more um, high fidelity or hi-fi wireframes and, and assets, we can easily do that by just switching the names here. So if we change this items icon to Apple, and let's say we change this one to blueberries. And let's just choose another random one. Uh, okay, let's do milk and we'll do milk for culture. Now, if we rebuild the app, you can see that the icons have changed and um, the 80 to 40, we've moved them back. Um, so yeah, so on the first view, basically you can see that moving things around, um, resizing and changing, um, icons 
or assets is not too much work. Going into the app, we can see that you, this is scrollable and we can click into one of them. And this will kind of take us to the other two parts of our MVP where, okay, now that we've chosen a topic, we wanna get a random word. So let's hit the randomizer and then we get backpack, right? And then this is again, kind of the confirmation view of whether after we've kind of acted or whatever, um, did we get the word or not? And if we did, we hit this. And then that word basically gets removed from the list um, in the future. And you can see that the counts are being updated here with the, um, the amount of words left. And if we hit no, then it doesn't. Um, so high level overview of kind of what the front end code for that looks like. We can see after the topic select, basically we go to this modal word view controller and he here's all the things that we just printed out. And um, basically we're going through um, and we're passing in the words that we want to this modal word view. So the controller passes it to the view. And then here you can see again, we have our no button, our yes button, and that's, this is where we set the titles. We can change that to like a word or an emoji, whatever it may be, the colors, all that is pretty customizable. And again, we have our constraints. So this is where we turned um, where things we wanna be into actual code and that gets rendered out onto the screen. So as you can probably tell, it is not too much work if we want to change how things look um, modularly. So in terms of like the font, the text size, the color, the icon, how big and how small things are. But something that would be really hard to change is let's say instead of these kind of cells going down, we want it to be like tiles or we wanna make it so it's kind of like Tinder where you swipe left and right and you get random cards every time. And swiping right is kind of saying we got the word and swiping left is we did. So that would take a ton of work, right? You can see there's no easy place in the code to change that we can just implement that change. Which is why going back to the presentation that it was really important for the, nailing down the MVP and then figuring out the lo-fi wireframes. And the lo-fi is where we decided, okay, we want a list of things and we want the yes, no button. And then once we decide on that, you know, like exactly where the button is, if it's up here, if it's down here, what color it is, if it changes color or not, like all those things are a lot more parameterized and easy to change than the structure of our app. So that is a um, super quick run through of the code base and, and what the front end code looks like for, for a simple kind of charades game like this. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you guys a link so you can download this code. And if you have a Mac, you can definitely run it and, and play around with it on your own. Um, for now, I'm gonna go back to the presentation and just finish off here. Sorry, Canva kind of quit on me. Give me one sec. Laptop does not like running all these things at once. It is super slow. Okay. So just finishing off the presentation now. Sorry, my computer is being super slow, just like skipping slides. So a quick retrospective on what we did today, basically. Um, first, we looked at the design process and what each stage meant. So we went through the research and, okay, what happens in research? We do one-on-one -on -one interviews and we do surveys. And then we talked about kind of working that into our example scenario. You know, how we design our charades app. Um, and using those terms, like what does lo-fi actually mean? What does hi-fi actually mean? What type of decisions are we actually making there? You know, it's 
those kind of lo-fi decisions that you think it's not just okay we want a black and white kind of easy to make um, image to hand off to the devs it's like do we want a list or do we want tiles or do we want like a stack like in tinder or you know like there's a lot of different um components in 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 software engineering that that we can build out but which direction that we go really matters and the, the flow of the app really matters so that's what we're trying to figure out there and then going into high five how do we put assets in how do we switch icons and and how how does how does that um actually get put into the app well the designer basically creates a picture and then we put it into that assets folder i showed you guys and then we change the name so that doesn't take that long right so at different stages we focus on different things for wireframe and then we talked a bit about um basically how ui ux um, drives software development and the collaboration between designers and devs and how that happens throughout the process and it's not um, just designers do their thing you know they hand off a design document to the devs and then the devs program it, it it's, it's really kind of the two working together and going back and forth and then lastly of course we looked at that real example in xcode and um, i walked you guys through um, some of what the controllers do and some of the views do um, and if there's any other questions on that later um, I'll feel free to ask them and I can, I can answer them. So, yeah, um, that's kind of where, um, we left off. And so where do we go from here now? Um, well, there's, there's a lot of things that, um, a lot of questions and a lot of different, different ways we can go from here. Right. So one of the major ones you might be asking is UI UX design or software engineering. Um, cause both are kind of in the field of tech and there might be some gray lines between what's design and what's front end engineering, what's back end engineering. Um, so I think at the end of the day, it boils down to if, if you're more interested in kind of designing the user experiences, or you want to be in the kind of business of creating the art and, and um, kind of actually making, okay, I think this logo looks better than that logo or um, figuring out those kind of decisions, then UI UX design um, is, kind of more focused on that. Whereas software engineering is kind of, it's more about implementing and building those things. So implementing can be implementing front end code, like how do we make this design into a website or into an app? Um, but it's more about kind of building it out as opposed to designing it. And of course, there's a whole world of um, software engineering, another side of it that we didn't really talk about, which is kind of the back end side of things. So I just showed you guys the front end code of, okay, this is how we make this icon go here and the color there, right? But we didn't talk about okay well what if in an app like airbnb like how do the hotels actually show up so we have pictures of each hotel and the price and we can kind of move those things around and um throw tags and, and change colors and stuff but you know where does that come from you know how do we source the data for that um, and how do phones connect to each other all those sort of things um, that would be more software engineering than ui ux design and then of course university um I guess some of you are already in post-secondary and some of you start in high school. Um, so for UI UX design, I think most people um, are in, in, a, in a wider range of, of faculties. So some people do cognitive science, some people do art, um, and, and, and some people do kind of um, psychology. So there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more freedom and, and kind of um, open-endedness to, to what major you wanna do in terms of UI UX design. And then for software engineering, um, usually um, it's obviously computer science. Um, some universities offer software engineering. Uh, for me, I'm doing computer engineering, which is kind of a combination of software and hardware. And then, of course, electrical engineers also do programming at, at some level. And then in terms of platform, um, you might be thinking, OK, today we did an iOS example. Um, there's web, there's Android, there's you know games, all that sort of stuff. And that really kind of depends on, I think, what you, um, what kind of product you're trying to make. So this, I, this out of the four questions, I would worry about the least. And I wouldn't think about, okay, web is hotter or iOS is better. Like at the end of the day, this is going to not make that big of a difference. And it's more going to be about what your app is better suited for. So for example, if we're making, um, I don't know, just off the top of my head, I'm trying to think like a, 
like a ride sharing app, you probably wouldn't want to make that into a web or a desktop app, right? You would want to make it into a mobile app. Well, other things like, um, I mean, everything's kind of going mobile now, but I'm just thinking like, okay, you, you probably, if you're making like a note taker or something, you, you're probably not going to take notes on your phone. It's probably going to be like an iPad or, or a laptop. So the platform really is kind of project specific. So I wouldn't worry too much about thinking about which direction is best for here. And kind of, if you have the big direction right, these kind of decisions will, will come a lot later. But yeah, that's kind of all I have for you guys today. Thank you all for listening. Um, if there's any, I know, okay, actually, not too bad, we're not over. Um, if there's any questions or anything, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Ren, for that amazing workshop. I know that I picked up a few tips and tricks and learned a lot from it. And I'd like to end off by thanking you for taking the time to come talk today. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for questions today, but uh, thank you for taking the time again to come in and speak for all of us today. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. And I'll now pass it off to Jessica and Alicia for the panel. Yeah. So we're now going to be moving on to the panel, and this is where you guys are able to ask the panelists any questions about UX and UI designs, their jobs, or just anything that you're curious about. And after their introductions, you can actually send in your questions in the chat box, or you can message Alicia and I, and we will read it out for you. Yeah, um, so today we have four wonderful panelists with us, Sarah Thompson, Sheldon Thompson, Nelson Neto and Anahi Lu. Um, and I'm going to ask the panelists to give a quick introduction of themselves. And we will go in the order of Sarah, Sheldon, and Nelson, then Anahi. All right. Hello. I am Sarah, obviously. Um, I am a designer by trade, a designer illustrator. I've been doing that for, I guess, it's coming up on about 10 years now. Um, I've worked in a little bit of agency work, um, but for the last six years, I've been working with Sheldon Stenning over here. Um, and yeah, we do branding, website design, UI, UX development, all of that fun stuff. Um, and we mainly work with nonprofits and civic organizations. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Sure, and I'm Sarah's work other half. So um, trained as a designer, also as a web developer, dabble in probably 50-50 of both in our organization. A lot of what I do is design support, working with branding and stuff like that, established brands, and then also taking, uh, designing like website mockups, um, managing a bunch of contractors and developers and making sure what we develop is a great website for our clients that is pixel perfect and has a bunch of like crazy functionality and a lot of my job is also quality assurance like looking through website codes and seeing why things are broken and all so yeah looking forward to uh being part of this thank you okay so i believe that's me now <laughs> Uh, my name is Nelson. Um, I'm a lead UI artist at Gunfire Games. Uh, mostly what I do is interface for games, which is a different part of UI UX that people don't usually think about. And we are actually needed, especially nowadays that game industry is expanding and growing every year. And what I do is basically just take all the information that designers they, they they create the game they, they say hey we need this we need that and then i have to think about on how do i present this to the players how do i make players be able to play the game and everything has to make sense so i'm also from brazil for those who don't know uh, i was born in brazil i lived in europe for about six years and living in the United States. Right now I'm in Brazil because of COVID. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've been in this industry for about six years. And prior to that, I own a advertising company here in Brazil. And before UI UX was a thing, it was called, at least here in Brazil, a consumer experience at the time. And my company, I, I did start this company because of that. I ended up, um, having a lot of really big clients uh, some i don't know if you know petrobras which was one of the largest companies in brazil um and mcdonald's and stuff like that so yes i i had experience for about 10 to 12 years in that 
position. <laughs> so yeah, that's basically me. Thank you guys so much for your introductions. Um, so Anna, he is actually having troubles with like getting onto Zoom. So um, when she does come on, uh, we'll ask her to introduce herself. And then, and now we'll just uh, continue with group panel until she comes. Yeah, um, so thank you everybody who presented their introductions, that was amazing. Um, so we'll now actually move on to the Q&A part of the session and we will go until 2 p.m. So until then, we encourage participation. And if anyone has questions, now is the time to send them in the chat or once again, private message Alicia and I. And yeah, go ahead. Um, so as we wait for questions to roll in, uh, I'll just start us off um, with the questions. So uh, we'll just go in the same order. So Sarah, Sheldon, then Nelson. Um, and the first question is, what made you choose this path? Again? Ooh, what made me choose this path? Well, I guess it first started with obviously my love for design and art and all of those things. I actually went to university thinking that I would maybe teach art or do art therapy. So I started with fine arts, getting my bachelor of fine arts. And then I quickly realized that it might not lead to a lucrative career that makes me any money. So I decided to pivot. Um, and I always just, I, I learned Photoshop at a really young age. I just love digital painting, all of that. So it sort of easily uh, transitioned into communication design or graphic design for me. Um, and I was really, really passionate about that. And then I realized that I love branding. So that definitely um, is a big thing. That's one of my biggest passions for sure. I don't get to do enough branding work, but uh, yeah, it's a big, it's part of our work. Sheldon and I together, we work with a lot of brands. Um, and yeah, that's sort of how I got into it. And I've been here ever since and I don't really plan on leaving. <laughs> that was very succinct, Sarah. Good job. Um... <laughs> Wow, it's such a broad question, but for me, like, geez, I grew up being super interested in technology. Um, I made my first websites when I was like 10, just about like anime and like random dorky stuff that I was really into and like loved it. This was before like CSS was even a thing. So it was just like straight HTML like websites and sitting there in my room doing my thing late at night. Um, and then I got into like doing lots of like music and bands and that kind of exposed me more to like the graphic design world of things because I started doing like album art and like show posters and stuff like that and originally i wasn't really thinking too hard about jumping into university like immediately after high school um but i kind of i literally just panicked because all my friends were like i'm going to this school i'm going to that school sheldon where are you going and i'm like uh nowhere apparently oh my god and so um you know i went and talked to my uh like high school counselor about you know career paths and things like that uh, they told me, hey, like, why don't you go to, uh, I went to Thompson Rivers University up in Kamloops, if that means anything to anybody, uh, but they have a design program. Why don't you check it out? So I went and applied and I was actually on the waiting list for it, but enough people dropped out that I was able to just like sneak in for the next, like the upcoming semester. And like that worked out really well. Um, it taught me all of these amazing skills about Photoshop because previously I was using uh, Paint Shop Pro, if anyone is old as me remembers that app um and yeah so it exposed me to a lot of like programs and stuff like that which is great but it definitely like school is one thing versus like the real world is such another uh, beast um and so from there yeah i kind of it was i struggled to get into the design industry i was doing stuff for like bands still but bands have no money don't work with musicians ever um and i ended up taking on a couple internships so i actually got to work with some pretty cool organizations and companies. Like I've had my hands on like Nutella and Tic Tac and the BC Lottery Corporation and gosh, um, a bunch of political organizations that I care not to name. Um, and from those experiences, I took what I can learning about like, how do agencies work? How does advertising really work in the real world? How do you design for a end user versus like yourself? Cause it's really difficult to take yourself out of the equation sometimes. And then from those experiences, uh, Sarah and I went on to start our own firm and we've been doing that as, as mentioned for like six years and that's uh, been its own crazy adventure. But yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, well, my path's not that straight, I guess. <laughs> and the first thing that I did in my life when I was 
at least that I remember is playing games. But I never thought about joining, you know, this industry because here in Brazil, it's not something that, you know, people in the United States are used to. Here we, um, we don't basically don't have any kind of industry in that term. So I, I was like, okay, so what, what do I do? And well, I was like 16 years old. And at the time I was in, in Europe and I was like, okay, maybe, maybe here I can, you know, can do that. But then because of family reasons, I had, I had came back to Brazil and, you know, life just hit me hard and I was like, okay, so now I don't know what to do. So I started um, uh, industrial design because I thought well, maybe I, I like, you know, engineering, I like creating stuff. Maybe, maybe that's a cool thing to do. But, I, but then I was like, uh, I don't think that's what I want to do. And at the time I was, I, I finished my, uh, my graduation when I was pretty young. So uh, my, my high school graduation. I mean, when I was pretty young, I was 17 years old. And I started, uh, you know, in college, uh, really, like, a really freshman, you know. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, this is not really for me. I don't know what to do. What are you going to do? And then a friend of mine, he joined the army. I was like, um, maybe, I, maybe I do that too. And then I joined the army. And I was like, okay, this is not for me. I have to go back and do you know, stuff that I need to do. I, I like to draw and I, I like to do those kind of things. And then I started uh, advertising in, in, in the university and I started finding myself there. But I really didn't really want to work, you know, making campaign ads or anything like that. I really wanted to make, you know, maybe apps or something like that. I didn't really know at the time. And then a company come, came to me and said, hey, uh, do you want to make this commercial? And I said, okay, let's do that. And then they required for the commercial, the, the commercial to have a app. And I didn't know anyone that made apps here in Brazil at the time, but I said, okay, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can hire people to do that. And I ended up hiring five people at the time to do the, the thing. And I watched them behind their backs, like <laughs> walking around the office. And I was like, this is so cool. This is really nice. Like, I, I want to do the same thing. <laughs> like, I don't want to be in my position right now. I want to be in their position doing, doing it, especially the art. And I did start like a second branch in the company just for that. And I started learning. And over time, I, I started doing apps for big companies and all that. But I, I really wanted to go, you know, to the gaming industry somehow. But I didn't know what to do. So what I did was maybe there is something that I can do related to what I'm doing right now for games. For my surprise, a Canadian company called me. Uh, Iron Bello Studios at the time, and they said, "Hey, do you know how to make interface for games?" And I said, "Yes, of course I do." And I, I, ne I never knew how to do it, and <laughs> so I just got there, and I was like, "Wow, this is a whole new universe here! Like, I, I, I can do whatever I want. Like, nobody will will say that I don't know how to do this because I, at the time, like games, they didn't really have this." thing about, you know, UI, UX and games, like it was super new. So nobody would know if I did, you know, anything wrong. <laughs> so uh, I just started doing it. And over time, more and more clients started asking me, hey, do you want do you want to do this for me? Do you want to do that for me? And then I ended up, you know, working with big companies like EA and, and you know, like all those AAA companies and Globan and other, you know, huge companies like that. And in the end, I was like, okay, this is just too much for me, like going through every single client and talking to them and, you know, having a hundred projects at the same time. I want to, you know, be in a company and, and just experience this for myself. And then Gunfire Games asked me to make some icons for Darksiders. I don't know if you play games, but Darksiders is actually a pretty big title. And I said, yes, uh, I'm going to do this myself, all by myself, just me. And over time, I was like, they, they really liked it. And they said, hey, do you want to, you know, come over and just take care of this department here in the company? I said, yes, why not? And then that's where I am right now. <laughs> wow. Um, hearing about all of your past was really inspiring. Um, so our next question is from an attendee. Um, they're asking, what degrees did you get to pursue um, to pursue a career in this field? Ooh, what degrees? Well, first, like I said, I started off uh, wanting to get my bachelor's of fine arts. I do think if you are a designer, uh, it's, it's definitely an advantage to be able to draw and illustrate well. That's a good skill set to have. You don't have to, but that's sort of 
what I started off, I did not finish my bachelor's. So I think I walked away with maybe barely a diploma, maybe a certificate from that. And then I went on and I did a condensed diploma in design from Vancouver College of Art and Design. Um, and that was pretty much it education wise for me. I didn't do anything else. I did a handful of internships, a lot of free or very cheap work. Um, I found in my experience that um, my education sort of took a backseat compared to my work experience and my actual portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, as for myself, I have my diploma in digital art and design. And I want to echo what Sarah said, which was at least in our industry, which is, you know, less technical in the sense of like doing tons of coding. A lot of what we do is a little bit more visual. Um, nobody really cares where we went to school or what diplomas or anything that we have. It's really like um, get a great portfolio out of university. That's what you want. Um, people are going to look at the work that you've did, that you've done, and not necessarily, you know, what you are on paper. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. And um, yeah, I think that's what I wanna say. Thank you. Uh, I think I said a little bit about this when I was talk talking about my history, but uh, I do have a, I, I did not finish my industrial design uh, degree, but it, it counts like a, a major now because of all the, the time that I spent in there. Um, not a major, sorry, a, a post-grad. A post and then I finished uh, advertising here in Brazil is a thing. I don't know if the United States or Canada, it's, it is a thing or not, but basically like communications maybe or something like that. Uh, and yes, I do have um, some post-grads and, and I have master's degrees and MBA, but this is more because I wanted to, you know, uh, to have uh, knowledge for myself just because I really like the this kind of university thing you know like <laughs> but I don't think you do need something specific um I do know how to code but I never learned this in in you know in the university I learned it just for myself and, and I think you, you should before uh starting thinking about where do I go what kind of college do I, do I go stuff like that you have to think hey uh, what do I want to do um, is it more toward arts? Is, is it more like a programming thing? Is it more like just the, the psychology aspect behind this? Then you can choose a lot of paths. Um, Ren said something in his uh, presentation that was pretty interesting. He said, oh, there's a lot of people in YUX that goes into psychology, something like that. Uh, and that's true because we do have to learn about, you know, um, a lot about the brain and how it works in terms of colors and stuff like that. So it's not about the the way go that will define your, your your career. Just think about what you want to do and then seek something and then start, you know, learning for yourself. There's a lot of really cool stuff in YouTube, a lot of really cool stuff in Udemy or whatever. And before you go and commit yourself to something that can literally uh, cost you a lot of money, just, just, you know, start a career, like go ahead, put yourself there and, and, and start doing something and then think about it. Because I think it is important. Yes, it is. Uh, but just don't don't do, don't think that it's the first step. Just do something and then think about it. <laughs> I'd love to like just add another thing, uh, which I think echoes off of that. Like, yeah, it's really a skill set over like degrees and diplomas and what you have. Like, um, it's I think it's understood that any student that comes out of any university, be it you know a like community college or something bigger or more expensive. No matter what, that's sort of like your like baseline. That's like kind of the worst you're going to be going into the industry. And what really matters is willingness to learn and like how hungry you are and like how interested you are in the field because that's what makes a difference, right? Um, I know people that they they learn what they learn in school and that's kind of it, and they just kind of get by on that, and they're maybe on the lower end of you know achieving things. And then you have people that are really into UX and really into UI and really into all these different things that's interesting to them. And so they spend their free time like watching YouTube tutorials and stuff like that. And their portfolio shows the difference. And when you talk to them, you know, they use different terminology. You can see their mind kind of at work. And like whenever I'm hiring a contractor or a developer or something like that, and we have a conversation, um, you can usually tell someone right away that's just like, yeah, kind of in it for the money. And they're gonna do like the, the worst job possible to like kind of get by versus somebody that's gonna do a really good job and go over and above. 
Yeah, thank you guys so much for sharing and like giving such great um, advice. And so uh, we got another question from the audience. They're asking, um, in terms of typography, what types of font would you highly recommend to make it visually appearing, uh, appealing? <laughs> Ooh, well, um, I love typography. So good question. Although that is a bit of a vague question, like what kinds of typefaces or font families would you select to make something visually appealing? I think that there's endless amounts of, of selections there that are visually appealing. Um, I usually, as a designer, I probably have my top 10 that I use as default. For, for almost all my projects that work really well. There's the classics like Gotham, Avenir, Baskerville, all of those ones, even like Georgia, like all the classics are a classics for reasons. Helvetica, we all know of Helvetica. Um, those font families are just great because they're so flexible and you can use them in many different ways. And I think they look great, but also Google fonts always has some awesome fonts coming out. And one thing that I try to use now is just variable fonts. If anyone does typography, download the variable just because it's super, super easy to work with. You get all those different weights. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was a bit of a vague question, but hopefully that answers it. Yeah, I would probably echo more of the same. Um, a good question to ask is always, you know, who's the end user? Who are you trying to appeal to? Like what's relevant to the project, right? You can use something that's very you, know, you can find a display font that's very like angular and aggressive and you know if you put that on like a, a you know a, an app for a flower store or something like that like it's not going to be appropriate right so it's all about thinking about the end user what kind of aesthetics do they want to see like what's what's going to be appealing to them and then of course um, usually I, I would say you pick like two two font faces you want to have a display font for like the like headlines which may be a little bit uh, more ornate um, and then something that's easy to read for like the body text which would be you know like paragraphs of text um, because that needs to be have like that text needs to have a little bit less personality in order to make it more legible and thus stick with the user um comic sense go with comic sense always <laughs> no Not just kidding <laughs> <laughs> the thing is like uh the, the the typography has a lot of stuff in it right <laughs> and by stuff i mean it's a science by itself um there are people that are actually you know specifically hired for that kind of stuff in some companies right but usually like just just you know think if it, especially like in games okay uh we do have more um how can I say this? We, we, we have more freedom to choose because if you're making a, a old school game, like a medieval game, you don't want to you know, use something like uh, Montserrat because it's super new. You, know? you want to use something a little bit more, a little bit older, but avoid at all costs, like the, 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 the kind of points that you see everywhere. Like you think you're, oh, medieval. And then you, you type medieval in, in, in Google and it will have like, I think it's medieval old something everyone uses that font, font so avoid that but don't you know don't don't fall in those pitfalls of using the same font over and over there are fonts that they look the same uh they're not the same they have a different you know kerning and stuff like that so try to you know get what you need to do you know think about hey this uh, what kind of thing you're creating and go wild but don't use don't use like five fonts in, in a project you stick with one or two and uh, you know that's pretty much it like always readable you know that that's it's, it's such a broad question that's really hard to you know go and, or i can go like ages here talking about it but <laughs> yeah that's pretty much it yeah um great advice so we actually have a follow-up question um follow-up for the question about degrees that was asked earlier so for those who have not created a portfolio what are some tips to get started and what are some things that you would recommend to add to a portfolio? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. And I feel like for myself personally, when I finished college, my portfolio probably was quite underwhelming when I go back and look at it. Um, 
I didn't have enough real world examples that were applicable to the agencies that I was looking for work from. Um, so in school, oftentimes we're sort of given free reign to do almost, you could say like passion projects or things that are a little bit too lofty for your level of skill <laughs> as a student. So I had examples of rebranding organizations and doing brand packages and just really sort of fun projects doing like craft beer bottle labels and like all of that stuff that designers love to do but then I would go and show it to people and be like this is not the kind of work that we do for our clients I hadn't even unfortunately back then I hadn't even been taught how to do UI design um, so I didn't have any web examples at all in my portfolio um, so I think something to include always is website design, website user interface design, mobile tablet, desktop, show that you're flexible, that you know how that works um, and do real world examples. Like I can't stress that enough. And then also include a good rationale for your work. Show that you're making these decisions and you're following design rules and you know what you're doing. Don't just show me a pretty poster. I don't, I don't really care when I see that it's, you know, it's, it's great, but does it work? Does it communicate? Does it reach your audience? Um, so sort of dive into that and yeah, just make it applicable so that if an agency is looking at it, they're saying, oh yeah, we just finished a project that's in that same vein of work. This person has those skills and they can sort of see that you would be able to complete tasks for them. So, yeah. yeah, I think um, what Sarah's getting at is having a really focused portfolio. And I think that's really important. Um, I see a lot of portfolios that, you know, it's like, here's three of this kind of project and two of this kind of project. And here's some random logos that, you know, we didn't spend that long on, but they like look all right. And so it's sort of like just like a cluster of random work with not a lot of breadth to it. Um, that doesn't really do a lot. Um, what I would prefer to see when like what what really makes an applicant stand out to me when I'm trying to hire somebody is less specific, like less random projects and maybe like three really good projects that have a lot of breadth, right? So not just a logo design, but like, what does the logo and the products look like? Show me it uh, in a mocked up on a shelf. Show me what the, the, you know, the shirts look like or what their app looks like, what their website looks like. So something with a lot of thought and consideration given to it. And then in, in terms of the rationale, um, you know, talking about, you know, why is this like that? Obviously, like that is probably a no brainer, but talk about um, who you designed this for, right? It's it's easy to be like, oh, I picked this because it's, uh, there's good contrast and stuff like that. And I like, like green makes sense. But like, what does that mean to your, your consumer and the person that's going to look at this, right? And then the other thing I really want to say is, I see a lot of really good work just like shoved onto a, like a word template or like a basic, like, poorly done up website, your portfolio itself is a work piece for you, okay? So make sure that when you're giving me your resume and it's got some work on there, that document itself has to have just as much thought and attention and time given to it as the work that's on it. Um, and I think a lot of people forget that and they don't realize that um, and it's super underwhelming. So literally, if I'm gonna check out your work, the first piece of work I'm looking at is you know, the email, the website, the PDF that I'm looking at first. So like impress with that and then you know, good things will come. Uh, amazing advice is like, I, I don't have it, almost anything else to say, but uh, for uh, the gaming industry, go to ArtStation. That's pretty much where you get jobs. That's pretty much where you show stuff. Um, and again, one really, really good, piece of art or a screen or just one project that is really really good is worth a thousand bad projects so don't stuff you know a lot of things in there and think hey i have like 500 things that i did in my career like i do have like over 2000 games or whatever like who cares like if it, the games are pretty bad <laughs> nobody will hire you you know um usually like especially in gaming uh, we have a thing called NDAs, like everyone know basically what NDAs are, uh, uh, non-disclosure agreement. So we can't talk about some of the games that we're working on for like five years. 
So it probably won't have enough portfolio, even if you were working in that uh, industry. Like you might have one or two games that you can show and like be working on another 15 games that you just can show and, and you have you can do anything about it. You just go and show what you did the best. You know, if it's just one, whatever. Like it takes like three years for a game to come out usually. One to two, from one to three years. So yeah, that's enough. You know, a company will look at it. They will ask you to make a, 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 you know, a test because they usually do. They're like, oh, this guy, is this guy that really did this thing? Or like he, may, he just, you know, used somebody's work. They will test you. And if you're good, they will hire you, you know? So and if you want to be hired as a lead artist, sorry to say, but it ain't going to happen. You have to start as a junior and then go to a senior and stuff like that. So don't compare yourself to leads or, you know, seniors because you won't have time for that. Uh, that's just the, the, you know, how life is. He, he is like 10 years in that, um, in that position or whatever. And you're like one, two years, you cannot catch him, you know, in time. So make whatever you're doing the best, just focus on one thing and just make it count. Thank you guys so much for like these amazing tips and like advice. Um, and so a ne the next question the audience asks, is what are some obstacles you encounter when designing? Ooh, well, a lot to start. Um, so I guess you could break that down into maybe personal obstacles and then clients as an obstacle. <laughs> um, and maybe time and budget would be another big, big thing. Um, personal, I think the more you design and create, the better you get at pulling yourself out of the equation. I always like to say, leave your ego at the door, whatever you're designing, it is not for you. And you can become your own worst enemy if you get attached to your work and you can't, I call it killing your baby, but you can't kill your babies. <laughs> you know, you have to be able to unfortunately kill your work that's not working for the end user. Um, so once that's, that just takes time and it's just a habit. Um, next one is clients. Um, that's definitely can be a hurdle to deal with. And I think sometimes they get in the way of the end goal and they forget that you share a common goal in making something that's appealing to a customer or a certain audience or demographic or whatever that is. So you have to figure out how to deal with clients um, and how to communicate with them. And really as a creative, you'll realize uh, after a couple of years that more than half of your job is actually about just figuring out strategy and communication. And then the other half is actually getting into Illustrator or XD or whatever you're working in and doing the work. Um, and then budget and time. That's always, you know, there's always not enough time and not enough budget, it seems like in the creative world, um, where there's a lot of time and not a lot of budget or a lot of budget. Uh, and a lot of time it's just those are things that you have to learn how to manage um, and also just I guess when it comes to budget for me over the years it's been figuring out how to really price yourself in a valued kind of sense rather than like I'm going to be $50 an hour it's no what is this what are my skills and insights worth to this company on a value base um, and that's a lot more money for you you just have to get over that hurdle of being like I'm just a pixel pusher and I'm only worth this much an hour. I think that that shift is a little bit of a, hur a personal hurdle as well that you overcome after a couple of years of doing your job. So yeah, hope that answers the question a bit. Yeah, I mean, Sarah and I obviously have, obviously have incredibly similar experiences given that we are touching on the same projects with the same clients and especially as, you know, business owners. Um, I see like three kind of, pillars that come to mind like it's process education and trust and i'm not sure where to start out of those three but maybe we'll start with trust um i feel like there's two kinds of clients that you have and can struggle with um there's the ones that just want to dictate everything and you're just the hands right they're going to say okay move this over here make it red make it bigger make the logo bigger uh, stuff like that and as a designer someone who knows what they're doing like that might be a really bad idea. Like the contrast could be off. Making the logo bigger doesn't make sense. Like it, it messes up the design hierarchy, right? Um, and so setting sort of the precedent that, listen, like 
I'm the designer and I know what I'm doing more or less within reason and stuff like that. Like I need you to kind of like lean on my experience for design and I'll lean on your experience for, you know, what the tone needs to be and what the messaging is and stuff like that. So setting that sort of like foundation is really important when we're talking about like dealing with a client one-on-one. -on -one. Um, within trust also comes process. So part of it, I think, is they need to trust that you know what you're doing in the sense of if you're doing a logo design, like, how do you make a logo? Like, how do you deliver that to a client? Like, do you just like make a logo and go, here you go? Or like, what is that process, right? So within all of these different kinds of projects, you need to have process figured out, which is a learning experience and a half. It's something that, you know, you'll be 10 years into being a designer or UI person or whatever, and you're still figuring out and tweaking that process. Um, so for like a logo, it could be like, okay, we'll present, you know, a few different concepts and then you pick one and we can revise it and you set how many revisions that would be and, you know, where does color come into play and stuff like that? And where do you talk about like messaging? and How does discovery work? Like when, like, how do you know what these people need to, how do you know what this uh, like client, how do you know what their audience is, right? So it's figuring out process and um, when you can walk a client through that and they trust you, then I think you're in like a really good shape. And then the other the other obstacle is education. So when you have a difficult client or you know it's 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 hard to deal with them and they're coming out of like left field with really bad ideas and leading the project down like this horrible rabbit hole, it's making sure that there's communication channels open where you can say, Hey, um, I, I hear your feedback, I understand where you're coming from, but like here's why that's a really, really bad idea and making sure that they're open to that. Now, you can do a lot to kind of like establish all of these different things and make it so that these are not hurdles and challenges that you have to overcome with projects. But at the end of the day, sometimes people just suck and you cannot always win these battles. And then, you know, you're always gonna have one or two projects sometimes where you like you walk away from it at the end of the day and you're like, well, wish my name wasn't on that, but here we are. And that's, you know, that's just par for the course. And, Hopefully you'll get paid. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, they said pretty much everything that I would say. Uh, the only thing that I think is learn to pick your battles. Uh, you will eventually win the war. You are the professional, but you have to know that you lose some battles and you have nothing you know you can do. The client sometimes think that the logo is that big because I want this logo to be that. Okay, so try to, you know, not find him on that, but he will be worried so much about this aspect in, in, in the UI or something like that, that you can do whatever you want in, in you know, uh, whatever else and, and just come up with something different. Um, try different designs, try different stuff and show him that you can do something really good without you you know hurting his pride because usually that's like a, a a pride thing they will come to you and say hey i know a lot of things i've been in the industry for like 15 years whatever but i'm i'm hiring you and i still want to you know i just want your hands i don't want your knowledge and that's not exactly how it works they do need your knowledge and, and they just don't want to um you know uh, how can i say this like they 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 will say that you're just there to do whatever they want you to do Go with it. Just just do whatever they want to do, and then add your touch to that, and and show them that you're capable of making something even better than they, what they were asking you. And when you start doing it, they will be like, okay, um, this is a good idea actually. Oh, okay, um, he's not that bad. And then he will start as you know, a trust was uh, is a thing that you have to to have with your clients. They will start trusting you for you to have more freedom over time and more freedom and freedom and freedom and people will pass the word out and, and say hey this guy if you let him do whatever he wants it's going to be good so eventually you get to that position yeah um so our next question is also from attendee so how do you decide which colors are best to use for your designs Ooh, that's a good one. I love color theory. It's, uh, <laughs> it's something I've been taught for a little while, for a couple months. Um, 
Well, first I look obviously at the audience, the end user and how they'll interpret those colors. Um, if it's, you know, something that was for say like an MMA gym, I might go with a very aggressive color scheme, high contrast. If it was for a spa or a therapist or something like that, you would want to do use colors that are relaxing to the mind. So there's actually a lot of psychology behind each color and what it means. I'm sure we've all seen those charts where, you know, red increases our heart rate and makes us hungry and makes us maybe a bit more aggressive. And blue is a color that helps calm people down or like bubble gum pink is painted inside of jail cells and prisons because it helps reduce violence so like colors it colors really really do have an impact on your mind so if you understand the basics of that it allows you to rule out colors not to use and then you're left with the ones that you can in a in good knowledge use for your work um, so then you have an assortment between there and it's really just figuring out what you want to do do you want to use monochromatic or do it like a triadic color scheme there's tons of different options there um, but i would really encourage everyone to just Google it or get on Pinterest. There's some great examples. I'm a big fan of also taking a photo from whatever project you're working on and making a color palette based off of that photo. Um, it's just a really quick, easy way to get a color palette that works with whatever photography or products you're using. So you don't have to think that you have to reinvent it. I know that was something that was a bit of an issue with some of the students I worked with. They're like, I don't know how to pick colors. I'm like, you have a photo your client sent you, go and pick six colors from that photo and guess what, you're done. Um, so yeah, there's little tips and tricks there, but so that's sort of what I would recommend. Yeah, another good place to start, I think, is um, you know, doing research. So competitors in the space, it could be you know uh, a brand that your client is competing with, or if it's like a video game, it could be another game in the same kind of space, right, genre. Um, how do you make something that is similar but adjacent and not, you know, not going to get lost in the crowd of like, you know, every brand looks the same or whatever. Like, I'm sure like every like nature brand probably is like green and brown. So how do you do green and brown, but make it also stand out, right? So doing some analysis and a little bit of experimenting and playing around, I think. Another consideration that will have to probably be top of mind, uh, depending on what you're working on is accessibility. Um, so, you know, some people are colorblind and colorblindness takes very different uh, varying shades of forms, let's say. So, you know, you can't just like check a box and be like, okay, we can't use red because some people can't see red. Like, sure, like some people can kind of see red, but there's also like blue and green deficiencies and things like that. So um, it comes down to like how high contrast does like a design need to be. And of course, like if we're talking about like a logo, like being black and white, like that's always like before you even consider color, think about what it looks like in black and white, but that's maybe aside from the question. Um, and the other, I guess, elephant in the room can be like a, uh, a cultural standpoint. So different colors have different connotations in different cultures, right? So if you know that um, a core group of people are being targeted by like the work that you're outputting and you're not super familiar with that, like you will have to do some research to make sure you don't use a color or like do something that doesn't make sense for them. I don't know if that made sense, but I hope that it did. Um, okay, so I'm colorblind. <laughs> so I do cheat on this. I usually go to a site and say, hey, um, what kind of colors are cool to you know match with other colors? And then I just grab those and use it. Nothing wrong against it, you know, like, nobody will know that you did it so uh, what i do first is i choose form and contrast and then i start coloring stuff because for me the color is like okay i'm the rarest type of colorblind not the, the monochromatic which is the rarest but i'm like the trees something add whatever which is like really weird the way that i see the world so for me it's like <laughs> um everything's normal right but for people it's like uh is this green i'm like i don't know i don't know maybe <laughs> so i go to you know photoshop and, and and i get the the color picker and i'm like oh it is green okay nice awesome Whew. you know so it, colors are basically just you know hex numbers so what you do is go if, if you don't know what to do just go with the logic behind it okay uh just you know go to a website get you know like triads whatever and think hey 
what represents uh, red, what red represents. And, and again, and talking about the, the thing about cultural, um, yeah, here in Brazil, for example, red, you have to be careful with red because we've been living for about like 12 years in a communist kind of uh, party over th that period. So red is a lot about communism. So if you're using something that is related to politics, don't use red. So be careful uh, with, with that kind of stuff, you know? And yeah, that's that's it. Like it depends on your project really. Uh, yeah, thank you. And um, next question, also from the um, attendee is, uh, how do you create a sense of movement, movement when designing posters? And um, how does the layout come into play? Ooh, that's a wonderful question. A lot of clients will ask us to make things pop or make them quote unquote dynamic. <laughs> um, so when it comes to adding movement to work that specifically say like a poster and illustration, um, a good rule of thumb obviously is angles and direction, creating sort of that direction um, and knowing where the human eye sort of follows things and understanding how to bounce an eye around in the direction that you want it to follow when it's on your poster. Um, and then also I would say any sort of curves, things like that, anything that is basically not a straight line will add a sense of movement if used correctly. Um, so you, there's lots to play around with that, even just setting your type on an angle or sort of giving your type some perspective or curving it or things like that. That'll definitely give your work some movement, make it a little bit more dynamic, but then you can also even just play with color and color can be movement as well. So you could go from black to like bright yellow and that'll sort of give a sense of movement as well. Texture could be played in there. So yeah, there's a ton of options rather than just sort of setting your text horizontally and not using any uh, shapes with movement or direction. So yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, I mean, I'm not all on board with setting your type at crazy angles. Sorry, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> I think what it really comes down to for me is, um, you know, I, I will echo, um, you know, the direction of the way that your eyes will move through a piece. Um, you can do a lot to kind of influence that and do something that's interesting. I think, you know, there could be a temptation to just like center a line. If we're talking about a poster, you know, center the headline, center body of text with like a picture in the middle, like that is the opposite of what we want. So how do you use um, the space that you're given to make something interesting? And that is, uh, don't be afraid of white space, I think. So leave some blank areas, make some areas that are maybe like a little bit closer together, like create some tension when you have two, you know, it could be an image or text or something when they're closer together, that makes tension in the eye. Um, and that can be interesting to play with. So um, yeah, it's like density versus white space. Playing with that in an interesting way, I think is, is, is the key. Um, and definitely something I see a lot is uh, not just boring layouts, but just layouts where everything is, uh, there's no hierarchy is what I wanna say. So have some big stuff, have some small stuff, leave the white space um, and that's, that'll make an interesting layout. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Um, if one motion don't make a a, a a static thing, that's stupid to say. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> the thing is, like, if the the more elements that you draw or uh, add to the scene that they are related to something that we know they are fast, you know, uh, like for example, a car. Right, a car usually you know go fast. That's it. That's a car. But you ain't gonna make a car with the wheels like perfectly aligned. And, and you know, like if the car is like in the same place, that's not movement, right? Um, but some cars, when you look at them, you you, you do have this, this feeling that they are moving, even they are while they are standing still. And usually they use this kind of uh, principle where they draw lines directing your eyes from one point to the other. Right, they do this in, in a way that when you're looking at something, uh, you start looking, for example, at the front of a car and then you go back. That's basically what we do, right? Because when I see the front, even if you're you know uh, looking at the car from behind, 
then something is coming at you, then it kind of simulates that movement if the car is, you know, uh, stand still. But if you're drawing something that you can do this, because this is super complex, like there's nothing really I can say, hey, do this and it will work that way. But, you know, like if, if you know that you have a, I don't know, like a, a foot, American football ball, like going through, you know, the air, like you, you ain't going to make the ball like this and go into that direction, right? You're going to make it go into the direction it's supposed to go, you know? So pay attention to those things. If you're making a composition, don't, don't you know, break the composition with, I don't know, I'm making some, um, you know, character running and then there's a wall right next to him. Like, he's going to hit the wall? Like, is this, you know, like just try to make sense of your, your you know, collection of images and stuff like that in a way that you just guide the player and knowing that he, those characters or whatever in that scene they're going to somewhere like give them a, a small storytelling and it will help a lot because the, our brains they, they kind of detect those small things like if we see a person like walking you know we have this movement so you don't really need to make someone running unless you run you, you want to give the the urgency thing in there you just want to create motion just put the person there you know it, it's it will create motion by itself uh, but it's you know like it really depends on the project and the 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 platform you're you're you know using yeah um so our next question is what does your daily work routine look like and this could be pre-covid or even right now just maybe at home during covid um your career sound very interesting you are all very passionate about it so yeah we want to know Ooh, yeah. So Sheldon and I, we used to have a brick and mortar office, but we closed that down probably, I think it's coming up on four years now. Um, so we've been working from home before COVID. Um, so for me, uh, I usually just wake up and roll out of bed and go straight to my desk. Uh, I don't do much in between that. <laughs> I like to just get to work as soon as I wake up for the most part um, and get read all of my emails. Maybe when I'm in bed, I know bad habit, but I wake up and I immediately check all of my emails for the day because we have clients that are on the East Coast. They're three hours ahead. We have a client that's in the Netherlands. We have, you know, there's all these different time zones in the world. So I have to be on top of that. And th some things are time sensitive. So I get all my communications done first. I try to get all my emails out first and then look at any urgent tasks that I have to do. Um, as a small business owner, I have what I call like housekeeping tasks. I have to look at invoicing. I have to make sure that we have a business license paid for for this year. I have to, you know, look at our books and look at the stage of projects. Do I have to sign contracts or NDAs or things like that? Do all of this kind of paperwork housekeeping stuff that is pretty dry and not a lot of fun, but it usually takes up a couple hours of my day. And then I'll try to tackle um, projects in order of importance and deadlines. Um, and usually I'm a bit of a proactive emailer. So if I get an email in, I usually respond pretty quickly just because I like to zero my inbox at the end of every day. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much my day. It's just responding to emails, trying to get some work in. And then usually now Nowadays, more so, uh, my days are interrupted by a couple of Zoom meetings each day or a handful of them each week. So that's just life how it is. Um, yeah, and otherwise, working from home, I think, is great for me. It gives me that flexibility, and I, ju I don't have to really deal with any people. So that's, that's uh, great for me. I will definitely say that I, obviously, COVID is a really bad thing but I love that it normalized working from home uh, because my goodness, um, when we first made the switch to working from home, people were kind of like, oh, you're like a digital agency, like you're a virtual agency, so you don't have an office. And it's like, yeah, but we can still like do all the work and like we had an office, like it's just honestly more efficient this way. And you know, there's some old school people that like couldn't quite like get their head around that. So love that this is normalized now, but um, anyways, um, my day, I don't roll out of bed and immediately go to work because I need, I'm not a morning person. I will never be a morning person. I need to like wake up, have my coffee, think about like, oh, I'm still alive. Huh? Okay, cool. Uh, so wake up. Um, generally, I have kind of a to-do list going. So it's start my day, like look at the calendar, like, okay, what meetings do I like absolutely have to be in that like Sarah can't just like take on my behalf? 
Um, <laughs> Um, okay, and then like figuring out like blocks of time. Okay, I've got two hours before like meeting A. Like, what's what's the most pressing thing to do for which client? Can I do it in those two hours? And kind of like so scheduling. Um, yeah, and generally like every day is a little bit different, right? It really depends on like what the what clients am I working with today? How busy am I? Do we need to do some like business development tasks? Like, do I need to like update our website? Are we working on some like uh, portfolio stuff? Uh, proposals for new clients. Um, so it really does vary, but generally, um, yeah, it's just a lot of like head down, do the work, get stuff done, kick some butt, hopefully don't work too much uh, after our time. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first thing that I do uh, pre-COVID, uh, that I used to do pre-COVID, uh, I just check on my team and see what they need and what they want to do for the day because usually i i don't say hey do this right and i usually ask them hey do you want to do this now do you want to do that uh because it usually this kind of uh, way of working people get more excited if they do what they want to do right someone that does not choose what they <laughs> want to do first then they will have to do uh, the bad things by the end of the day but uh, i just schedule everything and and start the day off of it uh i just basically just roll out of bed, get my stuff, drink my coffee, go to work. That's what I do. Um, I do a lot of crunch time, <laughs> but that's because of me. And uh, that's how I am. I don't think people should be doing it, but at the same time, don't like think it's a bad thing. You shouldn't do it all, like never. Uh, do whatever you have to do to make your day, you know, um, to make your whatever you have to do in the day, right? I, I never go to bed until I finish my last task because it starts accumulating over time. And over time, you're gonna see this thing going over and you know, like, because it's like a snowball when you look back back and be like, I just forgot about doing all this stuff and then it will come and bite you. So be, I, I just try to be as uh, organized as possible in my day. <clears throat> and that's the first thing that I do in the morning. And then it's just, hey, uh, I limit my meetings for one or two a week because meetings, they can disrupt the workflow a lot. Um, if you're in-house or, you know, home office, whatever, uh, it does disrupt workflow. So just do one meeting at, in Monday and, and then it, it, that's it. If someone needs something like midweek, I just, you know, call everyone, hey, what do you need? And that, that's it. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Like just wake up, do your job, don't left, don't leave anything for the next day and keep living your dream life. <laughs> yeah, so um, the next question is, what do you like and dislike about your job? Ooh, um, well, what I like obviously is the freedom to work from home is something big for me. And I used to enjoy the freedom of traveling somewhere and working from that location. Um, so that sort of quote unquote digital nomad lifestyle, I definitely enjoy that freedom. Um, I like that as a small business owner, I get to focus on many different tasks and learn many different things. I Even when I previously was working at an agency or an in-house design position, I was doing one thing over and over again, either for the same client or for different clients. Um, I didn't have a lot of say in sort of maybe the direction of things. So that's one thing I really love about what I do right now is I can go in from an introductory sales call meeting all the way to, you know, doing the project planning, doing the actual like brand design to wrapping up the project. I get to touch everything. And I really like that because it's challenging. Um, I would say what I maybe don't like so much um, is the stress of the flux and flow of being a creative is that work comes in waves. So if you can't deal with like the constant stress of, oh, we don't have any work. Oh, now we have a lot of work. Um, that That is definitely a negative. Uh, of course I can deal with it because, you know, I chose 
to opt to be a small business owner. Um, but that's definitely the downside is that you can go months without work and really, really stress out over that. And then all of a sudden you can have like 10 meetings in a week and close a few projects and, you know, have work coming in. So just dealing with that and being able to regulate your stress over time can be a bit of an issue, but yeah, it's definitely worth it. Yep. I think feast and famine is the name of the game. Um, so if it's really a matter of like just managing like finances and time and, you know, if you have to do a few like super crazy weeks, um, you got to be ready for that. And then, you know, when things are slow, maybe you take a couple of days off and go hang out at the beach or something. But um, beyond that, in terms of like negatives, I think like for what we do, uh, being a business owner and working from home, um, I recently moved to Nanaimo. I don't really know a lot of people here. So like, it's kind of lonely and like it's COVID, right? So like, I just like wake up, do my thing at home, work from home all day. And then when work is over, I'm like just chilling at home with my cat. I'm like, that's just like my life right now. And I can't like see my friends on the mainland and stuff, but like, ah, it's not so bad. Um, the good things I really think are, you know, I know I just complained about working from home, but like I get to work from home, like forever, as long as I want. That's awesome. Like, hell yeah. Never, never going back to an office. Well, we'll see. Probably not though. Um, it's great because like Sarah said, you can have so much agency when you work for yourself because you can, you know, not only dictate the way that a project goes for a great client, um, you can do such good work. You can also fire bad clients if someone's a pain in the butt and fighting with you all the time and they like don't want to pay invoices or they're just difficult to work with or you just like don't mesh for whatever reason you can say hey look like sorry like um here's another like awesome designer that i think would be a great fit for you like i'll see you later like no hard feelings so if you don't want to put up with something if you really really don't want to put up with something you don't have to put up with something and that's not something you get working for like a big agency where you're just a, a cog in the machine right um yeah i think that's probably like my like the best and the worst i hate my job next question <laughs> just kidding and the thing is like <clears throat> work with games it's just amazing like the people that i work with they are awesome super friendly people all the time no matter the, the you know the the company that i go for uh really what matters is the 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 guys on top that it, like the, the the stakeholders those guys they you know like triple a companies they can be hard to deal with but usually like for example gunfire games which is a kind of medium to large uh, company it's it's super awesome to, uh, when i'm there free food <laughs> free drinks uh, you know paid holidays whatever and they, they they give you a lot of really cool stuff we, we we go out all together to do nerd things you know like we, we're paying warhammer stuff whatever like it's amazing place to be in, for real like nobody's like oh you, you gotta be on, the, on your desk and, and do this job and you like now if i don't want to go today whatever if, if i can finish my stuff by the end of the week awesome like who cares you know, like as long as I finish all my schedule, that that's it. So this is a really cool aspect of working, at least like on the companies that I work for. <clears throat> as a contractor, I did work as a contractor for a lot of companies. It's basically the same thing. You dictate the hours and you, you do whatever you want, as long as you just finish the project. You have to finish the thing. You have to be, you know, uh, you have to have this kind of mindset where you were responsible for all the things that you do, right? We're all grown ups, so. <laughs> Please, if you want to go, you know, uh, and, and have a small vacation in the middle of the, the week, be sure that you have all your stuff done. Um, but that's actually a good, actually a good thing. And the bad thing is sometimes you work for a really, really long time in the same project. Over two years in the same project can be extremely, extremely painful. Like, especially when you're doing something and you're really proud of what you're doing, and then the design team knocks on my door and say, we're going to change everything. And they'd be like, fuck that guy, you know? <laughs> like, I just finished the whole thing. Like, and, and then he wants to change everything. Uh, but if he wants to change everything, it's still the same project. So we have to do it all again in a different way. So this is like, it, it really, you know, uh, starts to wear you down a little bit. But 
you can always get some clients and do some really cool stuff, you know, like maybe you just get a, a small indie company that pretty wants a UI artist for a really small game and it's a really cool game. Well, I love indie games. So <laughs> every time that someone comes to me and say, hey, do you want to work in our game? I'm like, I do. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> and then I go working for that game in the weekends and I feel refreshed. But sometimes it doesn't come, you know, and you have to deal with it you can't be like oh let's do another game like no that's not your decision that's not your decision you have to finish what you have to do well even if you don't like it and if you don't like it usually people say okay so fire yourself and and go do whatever you want you know but right now you're in this industry and that's how it is yeah that's it <laughs> yeah nice um that was really interesting hearing about the things you like and it's like you don't always get to find that on the internet anywhere. Um, so our next question is for, since most of our conferences um, participants are in high school, what are some ways high school students can get involved in this field? Ooh, um, when it comes to design and UI, and I guess anything in the creative industry, if you're still in high school, I would definitely look for opportunities where maybe you can volunteer. I know that obviously in the creative world, doing work for free or doing spec projects is extremely frowned upon. Unfortunately, if you just don't have the experience or the skill set, it is a really good place to start of volunteering. There's lots of either nonprofits or places that go and they look for someone to just help them with design or UI or social media or whatever you want to get into. And you can do that while you're still in high school and on the weekends, or you can even get together. When I was in college, I got together with a few classmates and on the side, we just decided to start a branding project for a fake company. And we just started building it out together. Just learning how to work with your peers. If someone's really good at UI UX and someone wants to do the brand for a website, then maybe both of you could work together and just create a portfolio piece for a made up company or select a local company and just rebrand it or redo their website based on what's there um, just to get those gears turning and half of the battle will be just figuring out how to do it and doing the research around it. So yeah, definitely like look at your peers, see who you can work with and see who maybe needs work for free where they won't be so hard on you because you don't have um, skill sets and they're not paying you any money so they can't complain, right? <laughs> so that's what I would do. Yeah, I think given that, you know, something that I always look for when I'm hiring people is, you know, passion, um, like a in general interest in the field. Um, follow your heart, which I know that sounds really corny, but like what I mean is if you have an interest in like video games or something like cool, like work on like a mod or something and like do a really good job. Uh, if you are interested in music also, like find a friend with a band, do some stuff for them, make a website about your interests. Um, there's so many ways that you can take like UI, UX, you can take design and apply it to, you know, a different interest that you already have. And I think, um, you know, if you really want to, you can find cool ways to do that. And it's like just another hobby. And if it's a hobby first and an interest first, then you can make a career out of it later and then learn to hate it. But <laughs> so uh, I can only speak for the uh, gaming industry. Uh, go make games for real. like. We have Unreal Engine, we have uh, Unity. They are all so accessible now. You, you can use Blender to create 3D models if you want to. You can create sprite sheets in Photoshop. We have like $2 softwares to create sprite sheets for 2D games. So go ahead and, and just make a game. That's it, like just do it, like start with it. Because one of the things that people really wanna hire uh, in this industry is someone that knows how to do everything. I know they always say, oh, you need to be a specialist. You need to do this. You're, you, you're supposed to be this character artist. You're supposed to be a UI artist. For real, like, as long as you know how to do everything, you can find a job, okay? Um, if, if there's only jobs for character artists, you can go ahead and just be a character artist. If you wanna change later, awesome. You're in the industry. Congratulations, you just made the, 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 the crucial, uh, uh, the most crucial um, 
I don't know how to say this. English is hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> but like, <clears throat> it, it, as long as you're in the industry, you can choose whatever you want to do later. You know, so be sure to do something. Don't wait people to be, you know, like, hey, this guy is amazing. Hey, come work with us. Nobody's going to tell you this if you don't have a portfolio. Nobody's going to pay attention to you. Just put your work out. Just go ahead. Do something. High school. I was in high school and I did a lot of small games. You know, I, I started with Unreal Engine 3. You know, at the time it was a pirated version because we used you to have like to pay something like a million dollars to have that shit. So I was like, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to pirate this thing. And I, and I started using it, you know, and, and, I, and I got used to this kind of world before I even thought about having the job that I have now. You know, so just be sure to follow whatever you want to do um, and just, well, just do it. You know, I, I don't want to be a child above here, like, just do it. I just, but you, you have to do it. You know, you have to put your, your own hands on the thing before, because you might think that you really like something, but then you start doing it and be like, oh, I don't, I don't like this. So better now than later. Oh, and with that said, like definitely check out like if you're curious about a field and you don't want to invest a lot of time or anything yet, um, just check out some YouTube tutorials and see if it's something that you're interested in. I think it's a really like low barrier for entry way to be like, is this something that grabs my attention or do my eyes glaze over when someone talks to me about this and I just hate it, right? So that's a that's a really easy way that you can kind of test it. Yeah, and um, I know that Sarah and Sheldon, you guys have your own um company slash business and Nelson does as well. So um, do you guys mind sharing uh, like what the biggest challenge you faced um, when you founded your company or when you started it? Yeah, so I mean, we sort of, I guess it started with just freelancing. I didn't, I never planned to own a business. Um, it just sort of, I guess, just grew into that to meet a need of that I wasn't finding work at agencies that I was happy with. I didn't enjoy um, the work-life balance um, and I wanted to work with clients that I enjoyed and I wanted to not, you know, hate myself at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, it sort of, it stemmed from there. And sorry, what was your question? What are the issues, like struggles with that? Yeah, you're like one of like your biggest challenges. Uh, I mean, I guess I could say all of it. I know that's not sounds very bleak, but I went from, you know, pretty much high school to college to being like, I don't have a job and I need to learn how to run a business. And I have not done a day of business school in my life. So it was a lot of going on YouTube, reading, doing seminars, doing small workshops, understanding marketing and psychology and how to close a lead and how to just all of the paperwork and all of that stuff that comes with it was not 100% expected. Um, and just the level of sales that you have to do, that is always a struggle. You have to sell yourself. If you want to work for yourself, you have to sell yourself as if you were a business. And that takes skill and that takes practice and it's not easy and it still is to this day a constant struggle to get more work for us it's a never ending okay we have to put out proposals and we have to connect with potential clients and how do we find people who want to use us for our services and that is very difficult especially in Vancouver it's a highly saturated industry every day a college pumps out like a hundred new graphic designers who think they're gonna land work in like this amazing big agency and <laughs> it's just not gonna happen you know so I think that for me that's uh it's just finding work is a uh, is a tough one and it's a constant struggle and you have to be really hopeful <laughs> so yeah in some ways, I almost think we were lucky in the fact that we were naive when we started the company, because if I had known how many challenges and how many things that I would need to know that I didn't know, I probably would have said, you know, like, forget this, like, there's no way we can tackle this, like, mountain of knowledge and challenges. Um, but, you know, we started off thinking, hey, like, we know how to design and we can build websites and all of these things. But when it comes to you know, being a business owner, there are so many other things, so many other facets to it that are outside of your skill set, and it's you know you don't know how much you don't know until you're in the thick of it. Um, and I think like when it comes to that, you have to be the right kind of person. 
um, you have to be willing to like pivot and accept new challenges and say, okay, I thought I was signing up for like being a designer, but it turns out I'm also, you know, an account manager and accountant and business developer and like all of these other things. Um, and for the right person, that's fun, right? Like it's interesting. It's a new, like it's a new unforeseen puzzle, you know, every other week or every other day or every day or every, you know, whatever. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential to like have a lot of fun with that, but also sometimes it can, it can wear you down and it can be stressful because, you know, your butt's on the line. And if you go too long without making any money, guess what? Like, essentially you have no job anymore. So, you know, and rent's not getting paid and your bills start piling up. Um, but then on the other hand, when it goes well and you know, you've had a great year, um, wow, like there's so much satisfaction there. Like you can look back and say, wow, I, I did all these like amazing projects. Um, you know, I've got like a little, like just a small amount of money in my pocket. Like I'm not struggling to eat. Um, you know, I bought like a cool thing, like, you know, and it feels really good. Um, so I think that's really what it comes down to is just like, you don't know what you don't know until you're in the thick of it and you got to figure stuff out. And I think honestly, um, gosh, when we started Thompson Stenning, I actually had another job and I was working full time on top of working pretty much full time with this business. So I think if I can do that and someone is interested also in like starting a business, like you can find time to do it. Um, just like try and figure it out. Like make sure you have your safety nets in place if you can, make sure your rent is paid, get ready. You know, if you're young, like heck, you can work some 80 hour weeks. It's gonna suck, but goodness, like when you look back on it, you're gonna feel like you did an awesome job and just like dive in. Don't be afraid to like make some mistakes because you will, there's no way that you won't. And you're gonna make some big ones. Um, but it'll be awesome and it'll be a lot of fun and it'll be like a really cool challenge. So yeah, that's what I think I have to say about that. It's been a long time since I don't own a business. <laughs> uh, right now I'm lead UI artist in a company. And the reason for that is business, they can suck your life out of you, like for real. It can be a really challenging experience. And I did lose two marriages because of that. And I had to travel the whole world, like from Europe to Brazil, to Brazil, to the United States and all the time, you know, and now I, I, I can be fixed in one or two places at most, you know, I come here to Brazil and stay with my family for a while, then go back to the United States, stay with the guys there, finish whatever projects I have to do and then come back here. So you have to be careful. Uh, I'm saying this in, in terms of, having a, a business is a really nice thing you can earn a lot of money with it i at the time i was making ludicrous amount of money like something that people of my age at the time i was 25 years old you know like people will be if you don't have the mindset for that you'll be like oh my god that's so much money i'm gonna buy a ferrari i'm gonna do all those things be careful because you you know as Sheldon said you need the safety net you need to be careful because one day you can be, you know, making millions and the other day you can, you know, be paying the salary of like 20, 25 people that they need to eat. They need, you know, to feed their families. So you can't just throw them away. You have to be careful with this. It's a lot of responsibility that you have to have, you know, and you, sometimes you feel the weight of the world on your back and it is stressful and you, you, you may lose hours and hours of your days and you may end up looking behind and be like oh my god i lost so much in my life but at the same time you earned a lot you learned a lot you've been doing a lot of really cool stuff and it may help you later on but you know you have to know that owning a business uh is not about yourself you're actually employing someone if it's a really small business uh, I believe like Sarah and Sean have a pretty healthy business because they 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 seem pretty happy. <laughs> so this is really nice. Uh, but if you you're starting to grow and and hire people and you know at the point that you have to you know uh, lease an office for a hundred people, then things start getting serious. And maybe you won't even get to that because you can't just you know uh, have a meltdown before you you get there. So be careful, take care of your health because that's the most important thing. It, you, you can buy pretty much anything in the world with money, but health, you, you just can't. Um, and 
it's not about only your body, but your mind. And later on, it will be something that will go through your body because the mind is one of the most important things. Um, so I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying do it, do it. It's an amazing experience if you can. But remember that you do have to have this kind of safety net and you, you do need to think about people around you. And if you, if you think that your marriage or whatever is not going forward and you have to, you no. Know, um get out of it just for your career maybe that's that's the right thing to do only you will know you know but be careful like you you have to you have to make a lot of decisions over your life and those decisions will be life-changing so especially if you want to make a business and you know leave out of it <laughs> yeah thank you guys so much for sharing and giving like amazing insight on ux and ui design and unfortunately, it is now 2.05 and the end of the session. So I would like to thank Sarah, Sheldon, and Nelson for joining us this afternoon. I'm sure all the attendees were able to learn something new today. And we will now be moving on to our second keynote speaker of the day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Take care. OK, so our keynote speaker is April. And April is a designer at RNG Strategic, an expert sustainability consultancy team that helps organizations tip the scales towards a more sustainable and socially responsible future. And as a multidisciplinary designer, April works across the spectrum of design to create logos, brand identities, and corporate assets, as well as designing and building websites. And having worked with clients in a variety of sectors, April appreciates and fosters the nuances of what makes each project unique to create lasting designs and thoughtful user experiences. So without further ado, let's welcome April. Uh, thanks, Jessica, for introducing me. Um, uh, am I, can I take over sharing my screen? I'm not sure who has control of all yes. that. <laughs> okay, awesome. So let's get that up and then let me know if you can see that. Looks great. Okay, awesome. So yeah, as uh, Jessica mentioned, um, I work at a company called RNG Strategic um, and I would like to thank you all for having me here today. Um, before I get started with my presentation, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory from which I'm joining this conference from. Um, I live and work in Chibuktuk or Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is a part of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. This territory is covered by the Peace and Friendship Treaty, which did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq title and established the rules for which was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people, but words enough are not alone, and there's no reconciliation without action. So um, I'd like to get my presentation started by with this quote, um, do not seek praise, seek criticism. And that's by Paul Arden, who was a figure in the advertising world in the 70s and 80s. And like advertising, design exists as a form of creative problem solving, where you basically are working with clients and various stakeholders to come up with the best possible execution of information. And don't get me wrong, praise is great and awesome. <laughs> But learning how to take constructive criticism and working together with your clients and your team to perfect design is really kind of what's at the heart of every single project you have. So yeah, my name um, is April and I, as mentioned, I'm a multidisciplinary designer and I work at the intersection of graphic design and website design and development. So I got into this industry um, basically through the schooling I took, um, which was an intensive two-year program that gave me kind of like all the knowledge and facets of digital art and media. So basically this program gave us a really intensive crash course in everything from graphic design to um, web design, web development, photography, video, audio, animation, everything, which at times was slightly overwhelming and I did not like it all. But um, in that process, I learned that um, I was actually adept at coding, which I did not see coming. <laughs> um, so along with, um, learning how to like code basically HTML and CSS and JavaScript, I paired that with um, my love of design to basically become um, a really like fully faceted designer. 
And um, basically being able to marry those two skill sets um, has proved really handy because any company or business that's gonna come to you asking for a logo or branding is basically inevitably also gonna need a website. So I'm um, gonna kind of touch on the company I work for. Um, so as mentioned, um, RNG builds brands for businesses building a better world. And how do we do it? Um, we help it, we do it by helping sustainable and socially responsible organizations um, inspire attitude and behavioral change. And I'm sure like some of you guys are asking, what does that really mean? It's a lot of fancy words. Um, basically, it means that as a company, we've made it our purpose to um, focus on purpose-driven work and designing for good. Um, and that as a designer, you are inherently responsible for the work you put into the world and the impact that it has. And um, RNG Strategic has basically made it our purpose and our focus to do that by working with organizations who are focused on shaping a sustainable, socially responsible and inclusive future. So mostly um, this is about deciding like what kind of projects we work on and what kind of clients we align ourselves with. Um, so we basically exist to um, help um, sustainable organizations really tip the scales toward change by um, working with them to help them communicate um, and visualize the good that they're doing. Um, and this is our purpose. Um, we really keep very closely to this and it's like at our heart. Um, and it basically helps us kind of really choose what to do and really like what projects we choose not to do more importantly. Um, so basically, put it to put it simply, um, if a business or organization isn't focused um, on creating a thriving planet, um, a sustainable way to do business, or a just society, um, then we really aren't the right design company for them. And um, some of the companies that we work with um, really are across the entire spectrum. Um, sustainability really isn't just about um, being eco-friendly. Um, Basically, sustainability runs everything from environmental um, companies such as like solar work, um, ocean technology access centers, um, and to like companies like electric vehicles, um, efficiency, um, agriculture. It really runs the whole gamut, as well as also um, like you can't really have a sustainable society without um, making it an inclusive society. Um, and basically, that sustainability is now like encompasses um, making sure that um, companies are also being like socially responsible in um, the places that they work. Okay, so um, our team is quite a small company. I believe we're around four years old. Um, so it was, it's a women owned company and at our heart, we have two different sectors. Um, we have um, the strategy side, which is ran by our director of strategy, and then our creative um, and design side, which is ran by the creative um, side. Um, yeah, and we are, yeah, quite a small company. Um, we have less than 10 full-time employees, and most of us are based here in Halifax. Um, and as we've basically committed ourselves to working exclusively with sustainable organizations, um, it requires us having that um, strategy, like sustainable focused um, sector of our team because that is really what um, makes us different from most other companies that just, that don't necessarily have this focus on the work that we do. Um, so my, the one co-owner and my boss, Sarah Riley is um, a really remarkable um, sustainability strategist. And we have a few other um, members on that side of the team who work um, with our clients to really understand what it is that they are doing and best communicate kind of like what it is to like the everyday person to get them on board. Um, and then we have our design side of our team, which is I, the part that I'm uh, a member of. Um, and as a designer, um, I'm not only responsible for doing kind of the basic graphic design work, but we also um, take care of everything from the web design to the development of websites. So basically we do it all. <laughs> Um, yeah, and our process, um, and as mentioned, as a designer, it's basically my role to work with the strategy team through every single step of our process, um, from our initial kickoff meeting with the clients, right through to the execution and launch of the website or brand. 
And we make a point to have um, both designers and the strategists on at every single phase because um, as mentioned earlier, like design is inherently problem solving. And coming up with the best possible solution and execution is basically going to be informed by all those initial um, meetings with the client and the initial strategy that we um, use to set the groundwork for the design and build later on. So um, a typical day or week um, for me <laughs> in my own position could include um, creating um, brand mood boards and logos, um, designing brand assets such as business cards, annual reports, presentation templates, um, basically anything that you put a brand on is something that I could be working on, um, as well as the website um, side of design where I can be um, doing anything from wireframing, uh, visual design mockups, and also the development and build out of a website and launch of that. Um, so amongst all of that um, work, um, we also have weekly check-in meetings with every single client that we have an ongoing project with. Um, and this is basically to make sure that um, both us and the client are on track. And then we meet weekly just to like keep them up to date with all the progress we've made. And then also, yeah, just like keep the ball rolling. Cause sometimes I've worked for companies where you not, if you don't have consistent check-ins it's really easy to kind of like let the project slide and then you end up being in danger of missing your initial um, deadlines for your projects, which is always a very dangerous land to get into. <laughs> so yeah, I found it's been really amazing to have these weekly check-ins that I'm a part of, um, just so like everyone's on the same page and everyone's like just really clearly communicating about all the work that needs to get done and what's happened so far. So now that I've kind of covered a bit of the basics and the history of who I am and who I work for, I thought it'd be really great to jump into some of the projects that I've been working on with RNG. So um, this first one um, is called Clean Catch. Um, they are um, uh, they create um, and develop 100% biodegradable soft bait fishing lures for recreational fishing. Um, and their mission was to reduce plastic waste in the water and protect future fish stocks, all while maintaining a durable, high performance quality. Um, because basically you can have the best product in the world, but basically if you're not gonna catch a fish, anglers aren't gonna buy your product. Um, so we had to position them um, with the new branding and logo to basically compete with everyone in the current industry, but also um, be able to communicate that the fact that they are inherently sustainable and biodegradable and a better option for the, um, the planet. So yeah, along with creating uh, a branding and logo for them, we also developed packaging as well as updating their Shopify website. Okay. So um, yeah, they were positioning themselves um, to sell in large retailers such as like Canadian Tire and like Bass Pro Shops. So we basically um, went into these businesses and looked at all the samples of things on the shelves to see who exactly we were competing against um, because it is really important, especially um, if um, these products are gonna be sold like in person and on, in store, like they're gonna have to like find a way to fit in with the current um, kind of market, but then also stand apart. Um, and after pulling some of these samples, we, it was kind of pre came, became pretty clear that there were some um, commonalities as well as some very cringeworthy designs that are currently happening in this market. Um, but we noticed that um, really bold text, um, pops of yellow, um, and really just kind of like agile looking design was kind of like pretty standard for this industry. So we kept that in mind um, with our initial uh, presentation that we gave them. So this project um, started out with me basically just doing a lot of sketches of fish <laughs> um, and then finding a way to pair um, some of these fish graphics with really like bold um, text as well as kind of just like keeping in mind that we want to have this be really like sporty um, and speak to like high performance and agility. And then it became pretty clear early on that they yeah, wanted to position themselves as more of a sports brand than a sustainability brand. So we kept any nods to sustainability really, really subtle um, and just kind of brought in some of that slight like biodegradable cycle um, into some of these like hooks and aspects of the logos, but we really wanted to keep it very much the secondary thing that people would notice. 
Um, and then, so from that, they chose um, this uh, version with the uh, small fish with like it really tucked in with the typography. And then based off of that initial choice that they made of my sketches, we kind of developed two options for them. One being um, a really clean um, uh, and like agile one on the left. And then the right version was a bit more detailed, but had a bit more pops of color. Um, just to really show them like the really two different directions that we could take this design as well as bringing in colors and like both of these kind of have the pops of yellow as well as really um, sharp angles and um, that aspect that we saw that was quite common in the industry. So they ended up picking the more simple one as the winner. Um, and then once this decision was made, um, we basically have to run the test to see like is it going to look good on all colors, all backgrounds? And then if it doesn't, we developed the, the two sec or the secondary um, logos on the right that have um, the lighter text. So we can actually be able to like overlay that on our darker contrast backgrounds to really give them um, a really um, logo that can kind of like check all the boxes that they need um, for in terms of usage. Uh, another thing when developing this brand is we wanted to make sure that they had this logo that was their main logo, but we wanted to give them a few options of ways that they could like pull it apart and have fun with it. So um, on the business cards, we actually were able to put this into um, execution where we pulled out the fish icon and had that on the front of the business cards and then um, brought just the, the clean word mark um, and put that on the back and then being able to kind of like show them this and like let them know that it's like, yeah, you can break apart your logo. You can have fun with it. You could put the fish on a sticker. You can um, embroider the clean catch uh, word mark onto a hat. You can really do whatever you want with this logo um, and have a lot of fun with it. Um, so moving on, we did packaging for them as well. Um, and because their baits are biodegradable, it was really important to them that their packaging was also um, sustainable. And we ended up doing a lot of research to see what other kind of options out there and presented a bunch to the client. Um, and they ended up going with a Canadian company that is based in Toronto, I believe, called Root Tree. And we were actually able to like get a fully compostable packaging option, which is awesome because realistically, if you have a biodegradable fishing bait but then your packaging is plastic that's kind of problematic so it was really great that we were able to find them an option that worked with them and stayed true to their company um, and for this packaging we really embrace the look and feel of the existing um, fishing lure packaging um, and honestly through a lot of my like personal design rules out the window if you would have asked me if I would be putting two <laughs> different outlines on a logo um, I would have laughed at you and shook my head, but we did it and um, it worked quite well. <laughs> um, and yeah, so basically we, when making these packagings, we, as mentioned, want to stay true to what's happening in the industry and really like push like the high performance durability of the um, product. But then we also needed to communicate that these were in fact um, also eco-friendly. So this is an like example of where when I was um, working on design, our strategy team was working with the client to really communicate um, what it is we wanted to like say on this packaging and um, kind of marry both the strategy and the copy with the design in order to like have anglers when they pick up this product be able to see like this is what it is and also um, that it is in fact biodegradable and different from what is existing out there in the market. And then also along with that we did a really um, kind of like quick uh, update to their Shopify website where we brought in some of the typog or, yeah, typography and um, styles that we had established in their new brand to their Shopify website. And then also um, kind of gave them the tools to be able to help them like communicate where it's like they have this website where they can sell their products, but then also um, give a few pages that actually speaks to who they are and um, what sustainable fishing can look like. Uh, yeah, so that kind of covers that one project. Um, I would say that was probably like maybe three months of work, three or four months worth of work with them that happened over last winter in the spring. And then another second project that I'm going to run you through is a bit different from the first. 
So um, Alice and New Acre Project, um, yeah, it was vastly different from working with um, Clean Catch, um, whereas Clean Catch was a new company that was coming to market. Um, Alice was existing and is um, Canada wide. Um, so they are an organization that pays farmers to increase biodiversity on their land, um, basically through the support of sponsorship from big companies such as Silk, TD Bank, and a &W. So we basically help them um, attract both farmers as well as donors to these two brands and really help them retain sponsorship. Um, and um, yeah, so basically the process for this was a lot more like all hands on deck because it wasn't just us communicating with a really small team of a new company. Um, this company has a lot of stakeholders, um, basically needing to communicate with sponsorship um, companies as well as like the farmers and communities that they're gonna be trying to work with to get on board with the Alice program. So with them, we have done um, multiple brand redesigns, two different website design and builds, as well as creating various um, brand assets. So this is a really fun one because um, we have like a really ongoing relationship um, working with them. So we've gotten to know their team quite well. Um, so here's an example of, this was the existing Alice logo. Um, and they basically got to a point where they were like, we need to ditch the Canada and the Western fam family initiative. Like we've kind of like outgrown that, whereas like we just want a really clean, simple logo. So we pulled that out and then gave them an option of like a different layout for it. So um, if they needed to go in more horizontally. And then to go with kind of the new um, slightly updated version of the Alice logo, we rebranded New Acre Project. Um, they initially had had this design that was just like really quick and simple. They basically just like needed a logo when they launched the project, but then quickly found that they had kind of outgrown that as well um, and wanted the logo for this kind of secondary initiative to really fit more within the parent brand. Um, and we basically yeah, used the same idea of three overlapping shapes, but um, pulled in a honeycomb element because um, bees are really important to like biodiversity and um, a healthy ecosystem. And basically they, um, yeah, the team over there is a really big fan of bees and what they represent in terms of agriculture. So we, they ended up choosing the option of the logo that kind of they had three shapes, but in the honeycomb. And then as you can see, these logos now like fit really well together and you can tell that they are a part of the same family. They work really well and strong to like separate, but then um, they also can look now like they're a part of a family when they need to be on the same brand assets. So um, along with doing the logo rebranding, We've also compiled um, a brand guide for them that outlines yeah, how to use both, um, both of the logos in terms of like, yeah, the typography, um, colors, photos, what to do, what not to do, as well as yeah, how these logos can work together. Um, and this document is one where we gave them an initial, an initial brand guide, but there's definitely plans that we're gonna be like building on it down the road um, as um, we find new things that we need to give guidelines towards. <laughs> Um, and then in terms of website design, um, whereas Clean Catch was just a really quick Shopify update, this one was actually one where from the ground up, we were developing a website that we were gonna build in WordPress. So when we have our initial web kickoff meetings, um, we have um, a meeting with a client where basically we have a big conversation about who the intended intended audience is, um, what the goals are for this website, and basically what user journey we want them to go through in order to um, do what you want them to on the website. <laughs> basically designing a website is kind of like part-time psychology where it's like basically what do we want a user to see, what actions do we want them to take, where do we want them to end up, and basically help them visually get themselves there. Um, and also in a part of this takeoff meeting, we kind of have like a feature prioritization where we basically get them to say every possible thing that they could want in a website um, and basically how many users are gonna use them and how often, and then categorize those basically in terms of what are our need to haves for the website and then what goes on the wish list for, maybe it's gonna happen, maybe it's gonna get pushed to the second phase um, when you kind of like reiterate on a website, um, but it's really great to determine what is essentially the need to have for a build. Um, so Alice has um, a current website right now that um, 
we were able to kind of review that and discuss with the team um, what elements we wanted to keep. Um, and then basically after those, that initial strategy and planning, um, we present them with wireframes, which um, like building a house, we kind of like, it sets the framework and the structure for the build. Um, we basically decide, yeah, where all the images are gonna go and headers and blocks of information, but you don't really get too deep on content yet. It's more just kind of like the roughing it all out, kind of like seeing the flow of it all. Um, and then after rounds of revision of that um, with the client, we will go into mocking up the visual design, which is what is shown on the far right. Um, and basically then you start to bring in kind of like what colors, what kind of photo treatments we're gonna have, um, what animations and all of that. Um, and then this is also where the strategy team will come in on their side and be working with the client to help finesse the copy and the headers in terms of yeah, what are, what are the headlines gonna be? What do we want them to say? And like really crafting that message in terms of, um, yeah, what the user is gonna work best for them. And then, yeah, we'll go through this process for every single page of the website for the most part. Um, and then once the client signs off on that, um, it's gonna get built. Um, so this actually, this project is currently ongoing. We got the go ahead from the client that I could talk about today in this conference. <laughs> so basically right now we are in the process of building out this website, which is really exciting. Um, so with this website, um, and like, as mentioned with this client, we've been doing a lot of work with them and we quite, and like amongst the bigger um, like web builds, um, we also have smaller kind of like one-off projects where um, a few months ago, they asked us to design a print ad for a magazine that was gonna be coming out. And we were able to take our kind of design that we had started to have planned out for the website and integrate some of those like new visual aspects into their print material and really help them kind of like carry this new brand design forward. Whereas now they, it, this is an element that they're in love with and they want to start bringing in this into like all their new assets for this company, which is really exciting. And yeah, being able to have this kind of like ongoing relationship with a client is um, really amazing because it, we just like having that ongoing dialogue with them about the choices that are being made and yeah, what, they're kind of in love with and elements that they really want to like pull forward with their company is like really great because it offers them to feel like they have some design um, insight and backup and expertise um, in these um, matters. So uh, this website, we also designed uh, the website for the New Acre project last year. And that's actually kind of like what spearheaded their design of their main parent website now is that like once the New Acre project had a nice um, website, they basically felt like their other one pales in comparison. So um, for New Acre project, um, we did the full build as well. And I thought I would be really great just to show you a couple um, different screenshots of what that website looks like, um, because we had um, a lot of fun. So this website is the one that is targeting the um, sponsors and donors and being able to communicate visually a lot of really heavy information about what their sponsorship is going to get them in terms of um, uh, just like reporting and basically knowing that like the, the money that they're donating is going to go towards something really good and give proven results because that is really kind of what's at the heart of sponsorship a lot of the times. Um, so we basically really had a lot of fun kind of like stretching and pushing at design to see like what are the best ways that we can really show a lot of this like heavy dense information in a really fun and easy to digest way. And then also basically um, a really essential part of website design and development is making this experience um, as responsive and seamless across all devices as possible. So um, as you can see here, um, we basically, I, I include a bunch of mockups of what this site looks like on all devices because no one person or not everyone's gonna have the same experience with your website or be joining it from the same device or any of that. So in that process of building out a website, there is extensive testing to make sure it looks good for everyone and trying to remove as much of that error, potential for error as possible. And lastly, um, another really fun project that we got to do with the New Acre project recently was designing their, a template for their yearly progress reports for their donors. Um, whereas they came to us with the content that they needed, that they wanted to use for this one report um, and we made them a template um, and work with them to really finesse what this template was going to look like 
And then we were able to train them and pass over the file to them. Whereas now from every report forward, they can do it themselves, which is really great because um, not you don't always want to be hiring a design company to do every single little thing. So if possible, we try and really put it all back on our client and empower them to be able to make the changes. Um, we run training sessions on our, all of our websites um, to basically show them how to update and create new content and basically empowering them to be able to like go forth with all their new designs and create it themselves. So that is the end of my presentation. And I'd like to thank you um, for joining me. And I was curious if anyone had any questions. Um, so it seems like there aren't any questions, um, but just thank you so much for your um, presentation. I'm sure everyone was able to learn lots about design and gain valuable knowledge on it. Um, and uh, we will now be moving on to the break slash game portion of the conference. So thank you so much again, April. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, so we will now just be taking a five minute break. So, yeah. And after the breaks, we'll have a short Kahoot game. Okay, uh, let's do the game during Kahoot. So um, this is a guessing the movie via emoji game. So I'll send the uh, game pin into the chat and go on kahoot.it to make a username and join. Okay, feel free to make a username and join the game. Uh, it will be 15 questions and will take somewhat seven minutes. Um, Jimmy, is like the num are the numbers that you sent in the chat the pin to Yes, that's the pin. Okay. Uh meanwhile I'll share my screen.
Uh, for those of you who haven't made an account, uh, sorry, a user a name yet, I have sent the pin into the chat so you can make one and start right away. So I think we're ready to start. Okay. Okay, let's start. Um, okay, question one. Which movie is this based on the emojis? These will be like pretty easy questions. So it's more like a speed round. Yeah, it's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. You can see the snake emoji and, and the stone and everything. Okay, next. We have a castle and snow and everything. Nice. Who got it wrong? <laughs> Frozen. Yeah. Coming first place, we have Melodic Chicken, 95. Question three. It is Lady on the Trap. Uh, first place, we still have Melodic Chicken. Question four. What is this? It's men in black, yeah. Either Finding Dory or Finding Nemo. Both answers are correct. Easy one. 
Congratulations, it is it. Wow, coming in first place, we still have Melodic Chicken 95. Yes, it's Ratatouille. Inception. Okay, that concludes our Kahoot game of guessing movies. Third place, we have VC. Running up, we have Bien Yoshi. And the first place, we have Melodic Chicken 95. Congratulations to Melodic Chicken 95. All right, yeah. So thank you, Jimmy, for leading the Kahoot. Our next event will be the long-awaited workshop. Bahra is a second year computer engineering student at UBC. He has experience in both front end and back end web development, as well as Android application development. To date, he will teach you how to create your very own website and help you take the first step into the vast world of web development. So, without further ado, uh, take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, how are y'all doing? Uh, without further ado, let's just start with the workshop. I will share my screen. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yeah. 
All right, so let's start with web development using HTML and CSS. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a second year software engineering student at GDC. I have experience in modern stack development for like one plus years. I started it since I was in like first year. So yeah, I also want to be a full stack developer. Like if you ask me, what do you want to become in like, like after five years? And uh, my recent project is uh, I just made like a web app of my group code project, which uh, integrated like an AI ML model for predicting images. And some of my hobbies include playing Brawl Stars and having like 24K trophies, so uh, <laughs> GG. Okay, so let's talk about HTML. So HTML is a hypertext markup language. And uh, what it's all about is, you, you might say like it contains all the elements that you see on the uh, on a website, right? So you see the title, you see the body element, and you see some paragraphs here and there, few buttons, few hyperlinks. So yeah, that's what HTML contains all the information about. It is also sequential. So whenever it starts reading, it, it reads first the header tag and then the body tag. Inside the body tag, it reads first the element, then the heading, then the second development, then the third development. And um, it also links the elements with their stylings. So it links styling with the CSS sheet, which we'll see just right now. So this is CSS stands for cascading style sheets. So CSS is used for styling the elements in whatever way you want. So it's like a canvas and uh, you've got uh, letters and few text documents and you want to put it in a way that is appealing to the user. So you style it with the cascading style sheet. So you display the borders around it. You can display a background of the text. You can even change the font size. And um, it's, it's really helpful to have an uh, CSS style sheet with your HTML document because it can style multiple elements at once. So uh, um, you, can, you can make like a themed document in which you just change a variable name and uh, it will change the entire theme of the uh, website. And we can also override styles. So we'll talk about that uh, uh, in a while. Uh, I actually have a question for you. So why do we learn HTML or CSS from scratch? Why just not go on Wix.com or like WordPress and then just build a website out of, like they just, they just have the boxes and you just place it around and then just, uh, use like your your thinking and make a and then make a website. So why do you want to learn from scratch? So first thing that it can be is oh, oops. okay. So there are barely any static websites. So you you see any website, you go on there. So it's not that the developer is sitting beside uh, in the back end and writing stuff and then uploading it over the web page and then it's going um, and then it's getting updated. So all of the pages that you see in these days are dynamic. So it, is, it has JavaScript and all kinds of uh, React JS components and everything. So that, that actually uses, uh, so for using those steps, you need to have like a very foundational background in HTML and CSS. Without that, you will just be lost. Like how even I get to web development without learning HTML or CSS. So, okay, so. I want to I want you all to go on menti.com and like type in this code. Uh, I'll just paste it in the chat if I can. Okay. So uh, what are some of the features you see in a random website that you visit? So I'll just go on to So uh, let's start by writing a word like the button. So it's here. Oh yeah, for sure, advertisements. Okay. <laughs> Images, banner, full stuff. Entry fields, search bar. Okay, 
people. So yeah, these these are the things that you see in the current uh, websites that any website that you visit, you have images and um, a logo and like a video embedded in the in the in the website, a banner, some text documents, a paragraph, and buttons and hyperlinks to different web pages. So yeah, we're gonna learn how to make all of these stuffs and how we're gonna style them and some more interesting stuff in, in the end. So stay tuned for that. So um, I hope everyone has installed the Visual Studio code. So if you haven't, you can just go on to, um, you just type in Visual Studio code and like you can just get started with it. Uh, just download it and uh, it should it should open up something like this. So, okay, so when, when you just open the window, it's just gonna open like, uh, the, this is the first thing that you're gonna see. So let's get started with HTML and CSS. So I'm just gonna open a folder. So you can just create a folder on the desktop. Uh, um, so control J. Okay, so let's not go into the command prompts and that's like command terminals. Let's just open a folder. Let's click on open a folder. And uh, on here, I can just make like a new, just name it like present, like PDC presenter. And um, uh, yeah, we can just select this folder and it will open it up for you. Okay, so now this is your workspace. You just got the thing, it's just blank document and you can uh, press on this button and it will just create a file for you and just name it index.html presenter. And boom, you got, you got the index.html file. We also gonna create a, a style.css, which is basically the style sheet that we need. It will contain all the information about uh, styling our elements and index.html will have all the information about um, all the uh, paragraphs that you're gonna write. So uh, I want to show you guys one thing because in real life, uh, the developers kind of work like this in which uh, they have their files open here and a browser open here which gets live updated as soon as we uh, commit any changes to our files. So I just wanna show you guys a cool extension. So this is the extension button. Just click on it and you can just search for ht, uh, sorry, live server. And then you can just install it. So I've already installed it. So this is how it looks like. Now, uh, uh, so after that I've installed it, I can just go to my index.html and um, you can also like download a few other cool stuff like um, HTML boilerplate. So it will give, so this is, this is just a shortcut which will provide like, if you, if you type in like HTML boilerplate, it will make like a boilerplate for you. So let me explain how it works. So after you install it, you can just create like HTML and then boilerplate. So this is what you get when you type that. Uh, it's pretty useful, it's pretty handy. Uh, it, it just makes life easier. So just clean this stuff. And um, okay, so get, let's get to our files. And this is, let's get close the extensions. Uh, okay, so this is like a boilerplate that was like pre-built using the shortcut that we used. Uh, we don't need this script because we won't be doing JavaScript right now. We'll just be doing HTML and CSS. So uh, as you can see, it's got a header, it's got a body. So I'll just, uh, so after you install like the live server, uh, you can just refresh your Visual Studio code and it should go something like go live or you can, 
uh, or it will just show it automatically here. So as soon as you press on go live, it will just open up a browser and it will it will just show your um, uh, it will it will just show your uh, current uh, 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 the project that you have that you are being working on in the in the browser. Okay, so uh, can you can you see this uh, blank window because we don't have anything right here. So let's just close this. Okay. Uh, so you can see here Meta Carset. It's like UTF-8 encoding. So this is this is nothing but just like uh, the the UTF SI characters that we use on the website. It's just the encoding of the characters. So this is somewhat useful. HTTP equivalent. You can just use IEH or you can remove it as well. Now let's go to the title. So we can just name our title as PTC. And if you just press Control S for saving the document. You can see that our uh, title is named as PTC. So this title is linked to the title of the uh, web page. So you can just press PTC, like you can just type in PTC and it will show up here. Uh, it's just a description content. I don't think we need that. And um, uh, uh, this is the viewport content with initial scale. So this, this is going to be important when we see some stuff later. Uh, when when we are doing responsive responsive web design so this let's let's just leave it here now in the link you can see that this is a style sheet and we're just gonna um link our style.css in with this so this is all about like linking our uh, style.css with the index.html so all the styles from here will be get linked to this document and whenever you just use them it will take the uh, styling from here Okay, so I'll just uh, the uh, the link to my style sheet is just like slash, and as soon as you press this, like uh, you just type this because we are in the same directory. You can just see like style.css, and that's it, guys. So we can we can just link our style.css just like that. Now in the body, if you just write like uh, hello world, and just press Control S. And you can see here, hello world is hello world is printed here. So you can just call it like the first website that you built uh, in in a really easy way. So this is this is all about getting started. Um, so the things that you mentioned in in this uh, icebreaker thing. So we got buttons and tabs and videos and banners. So let's get started. So let's start with um, uh, a heading. So. We just call it H1. Um, so, so this is like a heading tag. So uh, I'll, I'll share a link. So you can have a heading here and you can call it RN or something like hello and control, press control S and you'll see the changes right away. So this is what we call like a heading. So the number indicates here the, the priority of the heading. So if this is H1 and you write H4, uh, hello and control s you'll see that this is this is this has a low priority than the first heading because it's it's like h4 it goes all the way to like at six i guess so at six and then hello press control s you can see even a smaller heading is here so that's about headings uh, let's just clean this um, now we have like a paragraph uh, so it's denoted like with P and then you can type your stuff here. So lorem, uh, so uh, if you if you type in like lorem 30, so this is just like a dummy text and it will just uh, insert like a 30, 30 words long uh, document in this. So this is, this is just random text. Uh, and if you press control S, you can see like, okay, so this is not right. Okay, so you can see there is a dummy text here. It is a paragraph. And as you can, you can put in breaks here. So this is like a line break. So, oops. Okay, sorry. So as soon as you put like a break tag here, it is, it, it, it breaks the line from here and everything moves right down. So it, it breaks the line here and everything moves right down. So that's about paragraph. 
about um, links. So you can use an attribute like A, and this has got uh, a link to like HRES, and you can just link it to so this is what is uh, uh, an A tag. So this basically creates a link and you can type your world like A into google.com. You press control S. Okay, I, okay. So, so this is like a take me to google.com and as soon as you press this, it will just reload it to google.com. So one thing you can do like this and um, you can also select like a target here. So, uh, so target is like an attribute of the A tag. And if you just press blank, uh, it's, it's gonna take you to a new page. So this, this target blank means, so whenever you press this hyperlink, it will take you to a new page. Uh, okay, I don't need this every time. I never translate this side of the page. So this is target blank. So whenever you click on this, it will take you to the next, like a new a new tab will open up. So if you click on this, it will open up in a new tab. So this is this is very helpful because you don't want the user to uh, users view to get away from your own site onto another site. So. So you want that the user reminds like have a have a reminder of like your site is open still, and that's that's good for you right because the user experience is actually uh, keeping the user engaged in your website. So that's what our user experience is all about. So this is very helpful. You can click it as many times and it will take you to the the page. <laughs> okay, so that's about uh, a, a link. You can have other tags as well. So. Uh, let me, uh, so this is a very helpful link that I can share to you. Okay, so in the chat. So this is the official documentation of, uh, oh, sorry. So this is the official documentation from the developers of Mozilla and they gave all about uh, uh, so they gave all of, all the information about uh, the tags that you can need. So this is the HTML tag. This is the body tag, address, footer. So this is H1, H2, H3, H4. So this is the header tags. And like the, the important thing about documentation is like you should always go for documentation because they cover a lot of contents. And there, there's also a lot of things that I may miss. So this is a list. This is an ordered list. So this is a paragraph that you can use. Uh, this is a uh, hyperlink creator. You can even put code, code in that. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun stuff in this. You can just experiment and experiment and keep on going. So uh, let's, let's get started with like uh, div elements. So, so div element is one of the most important elements that you can consider. Uh, you can actually break your entire website into blocks, like into small chunks. And each of those chunks can be a div element. And within that div element, you can style all of your other uh, information inside that. So let's get started with that. So div. And um, okay, so lorem 10. And you press S. So this is this is like a div element. So so one of the most important thing about uh, web development is like you can just um, inspect element. So this is pretty useful stuff because uh, what we can do is we can actually see like what are uh, elements and what are tags, where do they go, and how the styling is done. You can actually do a lot of debugging with this as well. So if you see there is like a link, uh, lorem ipsum, our paragraph. Uh, so this is like a div element. So you can see our div element is up till here. So this entire thing is our div element. So if I just copy this and uh, go to the end. And just place it like three or four times. Just control S. So you can see like there is four div elements. So without any styling, we can see that the div elements are basically 
just uh, just down below, just below each other. So you can see this is first development. This is our second development. This is our third development. This is our fourth development. So we, uh, yeah, we can actually uh, we can actually inspect um, Google.com. Then we can just inspect this, and you can see that these are the things that. So if I want to inspect this, I can just click on here. And I can see that all the thing that's written on here. So this is the value, area level, name, type submit. So instead of this, uh, I can just type RN or so you can see that RN is written onto this and you can actually you can actually do it like legit. So this is RN and this is I'm feeling lucky. But but this is just all like you cannot update it onto the Google database. So that's all about like the uh, dynamic web development. So you cannot change it, what is on the server. You can just look it for your visual input. And if you just refresh it, it will just go away because it's the, the elements are getting fetched from the server and not from your local. So yeah, we cannot do that actually. That, that was just like interesting stuff that I want to talk about. So you can close this. Uh, so this is the dev elements. Uh, what else we got? So we can, we can have, you can have buttons. And um, you can just call it submit. And if you press control S, this is this, this is like you got a button. So you can just press submit and submit. And this. So this is like a clickable button. And um, what else you got? We got input. So input. And uh, so I can just name it as R. So this is like an input tag. Oh, okay, so what's happening? So this is like an input. You can provide your input here, and Aryan is like it's describing what this input is actually taking. So you normally see this in a lot of uh, lot of places. So this is the input tag. Uh, what else have you got here? So this is uh, this is some of the stuff that you can like do like which we need to know about it. So these are kind of important. You can see this on every website. Um, and if you want to know more about learn more about them, you can just go here. This is address. You can even put articles, main, nav. Then we can put sections as well. Uh, pretty cool stuff. We can even put like a list icon. So we can have something like a list. Uh, sorry, the ordered list. And we can have uh, list items as well. So if I, if I go on to this, um, I write here uh, P or project. Uh, I just so that. So you can see that this is a list item. So in this, inside the ordered list, you can put list items as project tech conference and you get this stuff. You can even have like, a, instead of ordered list, you can have an ordered list. And um, you, it will just, it will just remove these numbers. So it will press control S. So this is an ordered list because you don't need the numbers inside an in ordered list. So let's get started with the styling, styling of these elements. So I'll just delete this stuff. So let's just make a um, development. And I just type in Lauren 10. Oops. And then I copy it. And I paste it and I paste it and I paste it again. So if I just press Control S, you can see that I got like my four four of the elements. That's I can just do this. Uh, I can just do it below. Okay, so now you see that we got like four four div elements. Okay, so there are uh, multiple ways of uh, uh, using stylings. So I'm going to show you first of them is inline styles. So div elements have actually an attribute called style 
And what it does is actually, you don't need to use style.css from this. You can use like um, a style such as color is red. And if you press control S, you can see that it colors the element as red. So this is red. Uh, you, can, you can just use like div and now let's get into style.css. So as, as, as we have already linked style.css from this, we can use dot, uh, sorry. We can use uh, element selector. So this element selector actually selects all the div elements because we have not specified uh, which div are we selecting. So if I do color as green and press control S, so you see that it's, um, uh, it's, it's gonna color all the elements green, but because there is an inline text, like inline styling element. So this has a priority over the uh, like non, non, non inline style elements. So uh, I'm gonna talk about all about like priorities, like which is more higher uh, while styling. So you can actually overwrite the styles. So if you, if you inspect this, you can see that the div element is actually green, but it has been overridden by the element.style. So this has been overridden by the color uh, red because that was in element style. What else can we do is class. So we can have a class and name it as, um, what we can name it as, as C, C for class or something, okay. And we can have ID as well for having selectors. So I can just name it as I. Okay, so we have a class C and an ID I. So let's get into, so class is written as dot. So you can see dot here. So this is for selecting class. So class is an attribute. It has got a class attribute as C and we can select that dot C as uh, uh, as the C that we have passed in the uh, passed in this uh, in the in the what you call inverted commas. So this is dot C, and if you write color as yellow and press Control S, you can see that. Um, okay, hold on. I have not pressed Control C here, so I can press Control S as well. Uh, okay, so you can see that this is yellow in color because this is the third because this is the third class that uh, this is the third div element that we are having, and when you when you inspect this element, you can see that first it was green because our div is actually providing green color to all of our div elements, but it is getting overwritten by the yellow uh, because we have a class to this and we have assigned a we have assigned a CSS property as yellow. And next we have ID. So for selecting IDs of elements, so we can just press, like we can just write this character. So this character sim symbolizes that we are actually using the ID of the uh, div, div elements. So if I just write like I, so this will, this will gonna select this, this, div, this div element. So if I just write I and then press enter and just write color as black. Okay, so instead of green, what it's gonna do is it's gonna put, it's gonna make it black in color. So press S. So, okay, so you can see, so this is red, so this is green, this is yellow, this is black. Uh, uh, and when you inspect this element, uh, we can see that this was green and it has been overridden by the, the color black. Now talking about priorities, we can actually, instead of writing as this, I'm just gonna erase this stuff. So this is inline style. We can even write class within, even if it has an inline style, so class as C, uh, ID as, a, uh, ID as I. Okay, so now we have a class as C, ID as I, and also we have an inline style. So, so first it's gonna like, uh, first we have like a div element which provides a basic color as green. So if I press control S, you can see that it's red. So what we get to know is like the inline style has the highest priority 
So whenever you see like inline style, you mean that that has to go onto the top of everything. So if you inspect this, so you see that it has the highest priority, the inline style. Now, after this priority, ID comes. So ID is the second highest priority after style element, like the inline style element. So if I remove this and press control S, so now you see that it's got the ID of I. So ID of I is actually black. So now it's black in color. So you can see that uh, it's black in color. After ID, you can see that class comes in. So if I remove ID and press control S, we can see that it's yellow in color. So this is, this is actually having the class element. So this is actually yellow in color. And if, if there is nothing, so this has the least priority. So the actual div element, it has the least priority and it has the color green. So we can do pretty good stuff with that in which I can have like 10 div elements and I want to choose a specific color for a specific div element. So I can override that style using my, uh, either using classes or IDs or inline style, uh, which are priority you want it to be. Okay, so let's get uh, started with other things. So I can have, um, uh, okay, so I can have a um, div element and um, I can have uh, lower end 50 and it's gonna give a very big paragraph. And if I press control S, so this is lower end 50. And I don't actually need this div, like I don't need the styling right now. So I can just press control and backslash to like comment it out. So now this is commented. If I press control S, you can see that's all black in color now. And uh, in this, uh, we can have, uh, normally we use classes because it has the least priority after the development. So yeah, we can have style or uh, we can just use C. So we can have yellow. I just want it to be blue. Okay, so this specific div element has just green color because we're not assigning it to all the divs. We are assigning it to those divs which has the attribute as class, like which has the attribute of class as C. So, so now this has become green. Uh, there are other useful things that you can have in your CSS styles. And um, that is uh, having height height as a, so, uh, so far easy visualization first let's do border. So we can have border as a one pixel, one pixel in width, um, black in color, or we can choose any other color. So let's do blue. So blue in color and we can have solid. So solid means that it's not gonna be a dotted line. It's gonna be a solid line. So we can have dotted lines as well. We just you just write here dotted and it will just prove it will just make a dotted line instead of a solid line so i'll just go with solid line and um it's blue in color and um uh what else can we have here so one pixel solid blue so just press control s and we so we can see that it's 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 got a it's got a blue um uh, let me just zoom up okay so now you can see that it's got a blue blue uh, border around it. So we can have, instead of one pixel, we can increase it to like 10 pixels. And it's, it's gonna become kind of uh, not so good. So I'll just have it like four, three pixels. So it's gonna become good. So this is pretty good. Uh, we can have, uh, so now we can actually see what our development is all about. So we can have um, height as a uh, hundred pixels. So we can see that the height is hundred pixels. So like everything other than that just flows out because we have actually used like hundred pixels to be the height. So now instead of pixels, we can actually use a uh, hundred, uh, there are other units of measurement as well. So if you put like hundred percent, it's gonna cover the entire hundred percent of its required of uh, that. Uh, let's do 80% to see, 50% uh, to see it much better. So, uh, okay. We can actually, uh, we can actually like visualize everything right here. 
So I'm just going to inspect this. And we can see margin. We can see the border. We can see padding. We can see the element that's inside the div. Uh, we can also use 50 or 70 the edge and press control S. So VH is other unit of measurement, which is actually 70% uh, of your viewport height. So VH stands for viewport height. So it's gonna take 70% of your viewport height. So now currently the viewport height is this much and it's already taking the 70%. So this is just, so this is just this big. You can also have viewport width. So viewport width is actually, it's taking the width of your uh, browser, like whatever desktop you're using. And it's gonna take like 70% of that. So instead of height, I'm gonna use width. And now you're gonna see that it's gonna uh, accommodate for 70 viewport width. So if I press control S, you can see that this is 100% of the viewport width that is available to the browser right now. And it's just taking 70% of whatever width it, it can have. So uh, you can actually inspect here this element and you can see 70 viewport width so now you can just press up arrow key by clicking in here you can just press up arrow key to increase viewport width and it's gonna it's gonna you can easily visualize it as to how it is happening this so if you keep on increasing you keep on decreasing it's just gonna resize itself okay so you can just refresh it to like get onto the reset, like it's just gonna reset everything to whatever we have in here. All right, so that was width and height. Uh, what else can we have? We can have background, background color as um yellow. And we press control S and you can see that there is a background color of yellow. You can also have like a background of, um, uh, so let me show you cool stuff about, um, CSS gradient generator. So if you go to a random CSS gradient generator, uh, so for example, this, you can actually copy, uh, you can actually copy this as um, your background. So if you press control C, you can even set this to other, other things. So it's gonna have a background like this. So let's go into this. And now we're gonna, instead of writing background color, I'm just gonna press control V and it's gonna copy the background of linear gradient. So now if I press control S, it's gonna have a background kind of this because that's what we, that's what we had copied from here. So this is a generator, you can do a generator for whatever reasons you want. So if you want to do this or something like this, you can just copy from here and paste it here. So it will have a background like that. So it's pretty helpful. Um, uh, what else can we have here? Oh, we can have, uh, let me go to the end. We can have, um, we just, let's gonna remove background. It's kind of disturbing. <laughs> okay, so we just remove the background. Um, uh, margins, so we can have margins. So margin is actually, if you write as, uh, let's use 10 or 20, pixels so you're gonna see that it's gonna have a margin from from its left and it's then from its top as 20 pixels we can also use like margin um top uh 20 pixels and you're just gonna see that it's gonna take a margin of 20 pixels from the top so if you inspect the element you can see that the margin margin is of 20 pixels right here so you can increase this you can see that it's moving downwards and that's that's about margin, margin top, or you can just use like margin, and it's gonna make everywhere like 20 pixel if it is closer to the element. So so yeah, we're gonna have margin like this. We can have padding. So padding uh, influences the inner element. So if you do like a padding of 10 pixels, so you're gonna see that now the inner elements are away from the border for 10 pixels wide. So if you inspect this, you're just gonna see that the padding is 10 and you can actually see like what the padding is all around the element, uh, like all around the text. So that is padding, this is border, this is margin, and this is the insider, inside element. 
Uh, what else can we have? We can have color. Uh, I actually described color. So color is actually green in here. So this chooses a font color. We can have font size, um, font size. And th there's literally tons and tons of like um, uh, variations to choose from. Like what do you want? Font family, font style, display and everything. So I'm just gonna choose font size. And I'm gonna choose one. Uh, we can choose it in pixels. So we can have 100 pixels or I'm gonna use one EM. So what it does is if you choose one EM, it's gonna multiply whatever the default value is by one. So if I do two EM and press control S, it's, gonna, it's just gonna double its, uh, double its default font size. So this is pretty helpful in when, when you are not choosing uh, pixels because normally we don't choose pixels uh, in, in desktop version because uh, when you have smaller window size and a bigger window size, things get disoriented. You can use pixels when it comes to like uh, margins and padding because 10 pixels is very small. And even if you have a smaller device, you still want that padding to be around your gym element uh, so that it doesn't get crowded at all. So yeah, that's about uh, the styling elements that we can have. Uh, we can, okay, so now let's talk about uh, position. Okay, so position is nothing, we, we're not gonna cover much about position because uh, it's literally not gonna be used much in when we go to grids. So grids actually uh, throws out the entire uh, meaning of like having position. So if you use grids, you're good with that. Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna help a lot rather than having position. So still you can have positions in few places where you want it to be. So, um, uh, so there are, uh, so let's just make a dev, uh, dev element and write lower m 10 press enter. So this is like a dummy text. It's just gonna use control S. So I'm just gonna reduce the size to like one. So this is like lower m 10. Uh, we're gonna give it um, class as C as well. So you can use classes in different manners as well. So you can use class C here as well. And both of them will get the same thing. So it's also got a margin of 20 pixels around it. And it has also got a margin of 20 pixels. So you can see like having like similar element will like style in similar way. So now about, uh, now if we do, uh, uh, if we add ID as, uh, if we add ID as, uh, I, so it, it's gonna become black. So because ID has just overridden the, uh, the class because ID has a higher priority than the class. And we're just gonna do position as rel relative or we can have position as, so by default it's static because everything is static in nature. So as soon as we have relative, we can actually move the element in different positions. So we can have top as minus 20 pixels. And you're just gonna see that it's, it's just gonna combine. So if you, uh, if you make it like 50 pixels, it's just gonna go more above. So we can actually place elements here and there using relative positions or absolute positions. The difference between relative and absolute is in relative, uh, uh, the placeholder at its position is actually there. It's just got displaced from its place like above. When you use absolute, uh, so, so when you use absolute, uh, what it does is it actually uh, displaces the entire, uh, the, uh, it actually displaces the entire text around it and it moves on to like a different position wherever you want it. So it's not relative to its uh, siblings or its parent. So it's, it's like absolute. And then there's like fixed. So fixed is actually absolute with respect to the body, the HTML, the entire body. So if it's fixed, even if you scroll around it, it is, it's still gonna be like, um, uh, it's still gonna be this, uh, the, it will still be fixed at a single position. 
and there is also like sticky so sticky is not used much but yeah sure so sticky is like after certain position it's gonna stick to the top or the bottom of the element uh if i do like um if i do like a uh, thousand pixels so it's it's gonna um like i cannot show right now it's like how it's um there is i mm. position is sticky and top is top is zero yes uh wait i'll just uh mm. wait which element am i talking about uh see this okay yeah so ideas i okay so position is sticky i mean i mean like the 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 height from the top of it is not exactly like a, it's it's not exactly like 10 pixels but as soon as it reaches an exact 10 pixels like at the top it just sticks to the top and uh, you can actually scroll down and it will still be above like that so that's really helpful when you're using like nav menu so like a navigation bar it is always stuck at the top of the page and uh, and it's, it doesn't move like when you scroll up and down so that's helpful when you're using sticky now let's come to the grid so using grids so grid is one of the most uh, important concept that we have that we're gonna use because it makes our life so much easier you can actually instead of using the elements like this you can create something like a, uh, i'm just gonna make like a div and lauren 10 control s so you can see like each div element we're just gonna make it like a class a c sorry control c so now what we see is we got four four of these uh, we're just gonna remove the border, the width. We're just gonna remove the width. We're just gonna remove the padding, uh, these things as well. So now uh, we press S. We're just gonna take this now. Uh, one pixel. Okay. So uh, so grids are always inside a container. So I'm actually gonna make a div class and class as uh, container we're just gonna name it container so just let's make it container and what it will be is actually it's gonna become the parent of all the insider div elements so i'm just gonna put everything inside uh, so so now you can see that this is the container div element and its children are actually the four div elements right okay so as nothing happened here now if you go here and write as dot c Oh, and container and we just try to display as grid so you're gonna see something so so now the container element that is here so you can see the container as this and when you when you put it when you press this button you can see all the child elements so these are the child elements inside the container element so this is what grid is about. So we can have different properties at grids. So this is about placement of all the elements. So you can think of it as a 2D matrix. So inside the 2D matrix, I'm just gonna show something. Okay, so this is grid. So you're gonna have a title. You can place your menu here. You can place your, place your main here. And you can place your footer here. So it's actually styling all the elements wherever you want to put it in a more orderly manner rather than like randomly putting all your elements having relative and absolute positions at uh, different places. So it, it, it makes uh, uh, easier to design web page without worry about positioning. So if I display it as grid, now grid has different properties. Some of them are like, you can have grid template as this. Um, 
uh, you're gonna have grid template something like this. So if you now you go to this, so grid template columns. Now what it does it it distributes the it distributes the elements into like uh, columns. So if you do like 70, 30 percent, you press Control S. So now you can see that it is actually um, uh, this this div element is 70 percent of the entire viewport viewport width. This is 30% of the entire report width, and this is 70%, and it like keeps on repeating. So that's that's what like we define columns as. Uh, instead of using percentage sign, it's better to use uh, fractions because you you so if there are like 10 elements that you want to place in this, and you just and you just don't want to do like 10% um, and then 20%, and then you find the entire sum to be like 100%. So you don't want to do that. So instead of that we can use fractions. So if I do one FR, one FR, one FR. So it's gonna uh, split the columns into each fractions of one over three, because there are three div elements and each of them are like one, one fraction. So if I press control S, you can see that each of the elements are like uh, uh, equally distributed uh, between like with one fraction of whatever, uh, one, one third of the entire viewport width. So if I do like two, so and press control s so this is one two and one so this is one over four two over four and one over four so similarly we can just keep on adding now we don't need to worry about like the sum of the percentage is actually 100 or not so i can if i just write this one fr and i press this so this is one one two three four so one fifth of the um, viewport width this is two fifth this is one fifth and this is one fifth so there you go this is and we can actually, uh, instead of using this, we can actually use repeat. And what it's gonna do is repeat it four times as one of the fractions. So if I press control S, so you can see, uh, here it four. So yeah, you can see that uh, it's repeating one fraction as four times because you don't want to write one FR, one FR, one FR for like 10 times if you want to place 10 elements in that. So we can have something like five FR but because there is no element in this, it's gonna place it like one FR, one FR. So it's it's one over five, one over five, one over five, one over five. You can also repeat elements as one FR, two FR. So if if I do this, what's happening? Okay. Um, so wait. Okay, so I can actually inspect element as this. Uh, okay. Okay, okay, so so we can see here, we can actually see the we can actually see the containers. So what is what is doing is like it is multiplying four times one times two fr and it's actually splitting the containers into that, but because we don't have elements after four, so it's just gonna make it make the other elements as blank and it's gonna resize them in order to fit the other elements. So yeah, that's what's happening here. So if I like we don't need to worry about that because it's just it's just like we don't have extra text in there. So this is about template columns. We can actually have a template for rows as well, but we just we just use the columns. So in template rows, it will just come below. So instead of using four, let's just use three. And it's gonna divide it into three equal parts and one of them will come below because it's, it's just dividing into three parts. Uh, the other thing that we can have is uh, red, red gap. So you can actually experiment on a lot of stuff here. So grid um, gap has one app. So if I press control S, you can see that there is a space of one, one uh, font size or like the default value of uh, M. And it's, it's gonna like have the space in between around all of its div element. You can also have it as um, 10 pixels. And it's just gonna have the space as 10 pixels. So it's, it's really easy because now you don't have to worry about uh, placing all the other elements and you're having the margin as 10 pixels between this and having the padding between the elements as 10 pixels. So this just makes life easier. You can actually uh, 
it's it's very powerful stuff. Uh, what you can uh, other things that you can do is uh, you can have a justify. So justify content as um justify justify items. And it's gonna have center or end or start. So if I just do start, press control S. Uh, we actually have a lot of stuff going on there. So if I just do like Laura, press control S. So this is the start. So it's just gonna commit it to the start. Instead of doing this, if I do stretch, so this is the default. The default is actually stretch. We can just use uh, start. So it will justify itself to start. If I do end, it will justify itself to the end of its own. If I do center, so it's gonna center itself. So this is some fun stuff that you can do with uh, uh, like grids. Uh, then the other powerful thing that you can do with grids is, I'm just gonna comment it out. The other important thing that you can do with div is, uh, uh, sorry, with the grids is actually inside the C, just gonna, uh, I'm just gonna use like a difference. So this is this has class of one, this is a class of two, this is a class of three, this is a class of four. So if I press S, so now we don't see any styling onto the C because this is just this is C one. You can uh, oh you can also have like uh, something as this so. You can have multiple classes within the inline text. So if I do C and then provide it as C1, so you can press S. You're gonna see how you're gonna see that it's still uh, having this C as well as the C1. So now we 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 just let it be C and make dot C1. And it's actually uh, picking up the both of the styles from uh, from the styles and implementing it inside the inside the div class, like the div element. So if I press Control S, Control S. So in C1, if I do font size as two m, press Control S. So you can see that it is only affecting C1. C1 is only with the lower end. So you can see that it's just double the size of its uh, element, as well as has this as its style. So you can have a style. And you can have another style which is derived from the parent. So this is some good stuff that you can have. Now in C1, uh, what I'm going to use is grids as a, you can have something like this. So grid column, uh, you can just do something like one by three. So what it does is, so when you see a grid, right? So, uh, so, so this is a grid. Now this is, uh, so by using grid column, one, two, three, you're actually saying, so this is first. So this is, so this is first, first line of the grid. This is second line of the grid. This is third line of the grid. And this is fourth line of the grid. So if you do grid column one, two, three, so you're actually saying that you're spanning the C1 class from first column all the way up to third column. So if I press Control S, you're gonna see that it's uh, it takes up first column, it takes up second column, and it takes up till third column. So you can have actually this thing uh, as span span up to like um, uh, the third column, and the rest is like just separate, segregated in the end. And if it doesn't have space, it's just gonna put the other as uh, other just below of them. So it's just gonna auto adjust everything. So that's one powerful thing about grid. Uh, you can also have like grid row and uh, instead of one is to three i'm just gonna do one to two so now you can see that it is one and this is one this is two so it's not gonna affect it but if i do something as three so you can see that it will come all the way up to down so you can see that so so now you can see that it's first column it's second column and it's, uh, it's first second and third so so this is the so this is the first row uh, sorry, this is the first row, this is the second row, and this is the third row. So it has spanned all the way from one to three. So if you if you actually look at the Microsoft, uh, the start button, like if you press the start button, you can actually see all the uh, uh, all the icons as the grid elements. So you can actually make your website 
uh, have a theme of Microsoft start like start menu. Uh, so this is this is what you can actually do. And the cool thing about grids is as well about this is so you can have dot c2 and you can overlap elements onto the top. So if I do grid row, uh, so this is the fourth element, I guess. So if I inspect it, so this is the fourth, this is the fourth object. So we can have the C4 or C4 uh, written here, right here. So instead of C2, if I write C4, and if I do grid row as um, a grid row as two to three. So if I just do two, uh, two to three and press enter, uh, control S. Yeah, what's the row? Did I save it here? Why is C4 in there? Why is it affecting my other? Uh, so, so now you can see that the grid column is actually from two up to three. So first is left here. Uh, it starts from second and it goes all the way up to three. Uh, for third uh, row, I want to have it from two to four. Okay, so now you can see, so this has actually, what it has done is, it has overlapped the elements. So now you can see that you can actually overlap elements in 2D. Uh, so there is uh, something like, uh, as there is grid, there is also something like flex. So in the grid, you can, uh, in the flex, you can have all this like 1D. So it has to be either in rows, uh, in columns or in rows. Now the powerful thing about grid is you can actually do styling in two dimensions. So you can either have in rows or in columns and you can actually overlap elements onto each other. So if you go on Facebook or any other social media site, you can actually see your profile picture uh, overlapped onto the background. So there is a background picture and then there is like a profile picture. So they overlap onto each other. This, this is done using like grid rows or grid columns. So, so this is like a powerful stuff. So if I do something like one, two, three, two, one to two actually. So you can see like this is my background and this is my uh, uh, this is my uh, uh, profile picture and this is my background. So you can just have it something like that. Uh, about other things. So let's talk about responsiveness. So, so this is the grid. Uh, it's, it's very helpful for styling elements. You don't need to have like positions absolute and relative and all of the things. You can just overlap stops. You can uh, uh, very easily uh, style them. Uh, okay, so let's talk about. Um, okay, I'm just gonna remove this. So let's talk about um, uh, responsiveness. So about responsiveness. Uh, let's present. So instead, so what's responsiveness is? So when you're on desktop, so many uh, famous website that you visit. So when you're on desktop, it looks all the nice. You have a nav bar menu and everything. When you go on a tablet, it auto adjusts all the elements and it moves the main up to here. The header is here and the menu is still there. But when you go into a mobile, so in mobile, it will just get crowded to display all the information into one thing. So you need to have responsiveness in which the browser automatically detects where, which type of device it is. So if it is a mobile device, it's gonna have like um, uh, it's gonna have elements which is like just below each other. So you can have anything, any kind of style. So uh, I'm just gonna show you on this. So if I do inspect element, and there is actually um, okay. So there is actually here is a button known as your toggle device toolbar, and it shows up there. So now you can actually see that this is mobile version. And in mobile version, we are actually having the same thing as you go on a desktop version. So this is the desktop version. This is the mobile version. So this is desktop and this is mobile. So in mobile also, we are having the same thing. Now, instead of that, if I want to do like, if, if the pixel size of the device is smaller than a particular, uh, particular boundary, 
it's auto it's just going to auto adjust itself so that's how we use uh, media queries so media query uh, that media media screen and i'm just going to put like a I'm just going to put like a max width of like 900 pixels. So media only screen max width has to be 900 pixels. So whenever it goes below 900 pixels, it's just going to auto adjust itself. So we are just going to um, have um, uh, C1. So we are just going to have C1. Just going to copy it and paste it here. So now you want to overwrite your styles whenever it goes below 900 pixels. So maximum width should be 900 pixels. As soon as it goes below 900 pixels, what I want to do is I want to overwrite the C1 class and I want to have it to go all the way till the end. So instead of having grid columns as one is to three, I'm just gonna do it one is to four. And grid row as, I'm just gonna do it one is to two. So it becomes smaller in size. If I press control S, you can see that it goes all the way till the end. And then you can see that it's two elements. So it's it's literally at like 300 pixels. Uh, the width of the screen is like 300 pixels. Now, when I do it like a thousand pixels. So, wait, uh, to, uh, so let's, uh, for the sake of it, let's just reduce it to like um, 500 pixels. So as soon as the device goes below 500 pixels, it's just going to auto adjust itself. And I'm just going to increase the size of this. Okay. So um, so now you can see that as soon as I uh, stretch it all the way till bottom, as soon as it reaches like 500 pixels, it's just going to auto adjust itself. So you, can you see this? So this is this is like auto adjusting itself. So in phone, you can, in phone, you can, uh, so this is what you'll see on a laptop screen. And this is what you'll see on a mobile screen. So in mobile screen, you can have your heading as this. And in laptop screen, you can actually have your background here and you can have some information here. And in, in, in mobile screen, you can have your information here and like a heading there. So this is some cool stuff about media queries. You can actually have multiple media queries and then you're just gonna uh, increase it. Uh, uh, become, let's, let's become like uh, 200 pixels. And then uh, something else has to be performed within that 200 pixels. So you can just put like, uh, uh one two three so control s so now you can see uh, wait you can do a uh, grid column i want it to be one is one two two and i'm just going to remove this that is control s so now if you go below 200 you can see that it is actually auto adjusting itself because i just said like the grid column has to be one to two and not one to four because it's the whole span so instead of that i just have one to two so by that, I can actually have multiple multiple media queries and I can style them with the device width and size. So that's good thing about media on the screen, like media queries. That's how we that's how we get into responsiveness. Um, this is I think this is it, and uh, you just got to learn about styling and elements, and uh, you also got to learn about grid and uh, media queries and responsiveness. So uh, that's a lot of thing to learn right now. I want to um, share a link of, uh, it's, it's just about like uh, uh, doing your operations onto this. So you can just go into the, hold up, I'll just copy the link. Uh, in the chat. Okay, so okay, so I sent you a link to the Google Drive, and it's actually when you open that, uh, you will get to see something like um, uh, PDC. Do I have it? No. Just put my screen. Uh, so this is the PPC, and uh, if you open this as, oh, never open it with, uh, open it with Chrome. And you can see that you can actually make this stuff, what, whatever you have learned right now, you can actually make this stuff just by using that. 
So you can actually embed and uh, uh, like pictures using the background. Uh, you can actually embed uh, like um, uh, the, uh, so let, let, let me just uh, inspect and let me just show you how it's done. So you can actually operate onto this entire website and you can actually have a, a much better understanding on how it's made. So I divided everything into like a different elements. So this is background. This is the profile picture, like the display picture at DP. I have a bio right here. I have a sidebar. I have posts. So these are the posts. I have links to the posts and I have a footer, which is actually just like a image Google credits. Um, so you can actually open this up and you can actually see the picture in here. Uh, you can actually open the bio and it is actually just unordered list. So these are actually just unordered list. You can open the sidebar and you can have something like an email. So this is the, uh, this is the A tag that we just talked about. We can have a heading as H4. We can have inline styling and we can have a blank. So if, if you click on this, uh, it's it's actually gonna email me something. If I click on LinkedIn or if I click on GitHub, uh, it's just gonna take me to GitHub. So github.com slash RMB. So this is my GitHub account. You can actually go and watch there, like whatever you want. Um, so these are just div elements. You can have LinkedIn profile and uh, you can also have actually uh, div elements inside div elements, which we talked about. So this is a parent div named as post. And we have a smaller div elements named as P1. And then it has an image description in the background. So there is a link. And uh, if, you, if you want to go to that link, you can just click on this and it will take you to the link. Currently it's just google.com. So if you press on this link, it will take you to google.com. You have some inline text. You have a name called as link. And then you have an image. So it's just about like, I told you about like the background thing. So in the CSS gradient, so instead of background thing, you can actually have here like a URL. Uh, I cannot edit it. Okay. You can have something like a, uh, you can have something like a, a background as a, as a URL. And then instead of this, you can have URL and then you can go to any Google image or even your local, you can, paste it from local, but there is no image in the local right now. So even you can you can go to like google.com and copy the link address and just paste it here. So um, so yeah, you can paste the background and to just display the background onto that. Uh, so these are the posts and this is the inside the inside the links, you have buttons, which we also talked about. So buttons on click, it just takes you to the location of P1. So if you press P1, it will take you to P1. If you press P2, it will take you to P2. If you press P3, if you press P3, it'll take you to P3. Um, so this this just that, and then there is a div, div, div element which has the Google images in the end. So yeah, you can actually do a lot of stuff on this website, like a yeah, web page. You can actually like inspect this, like what is this? So you can just see like a list element. You can inspect onto this. You can just see like it's a description for the post. So this is post one. So you can have multiple child elements. So inside this child, there is a single post. Inside the post, you have description. And then there is like, a, so this is like a grid elements, which has like even spacing in between. So by that you can actually um, uh, like space all the, uh, all the posts, like space evenly, instead of worrying about how much margin you need to put and how much uh, uh, padding you need to put. So yeah, that's this. You can actually check here like what CSS you have used. And uh, the, um, the zip file that I sent to you, uh, you can just open it with uh, Visual Studio Code. So I can do is like, I can open here with open with code. And what you'll see is this. Um, uh, okay. What you can see is this. So it's, it's just gonna open all the stuffs in here and you can have your index and styles.css. Um, so you can actually have what all of the things you have in here. We have a table of this. If you, need, if you change something in here, everything is the same. And right down here, we have a media query as well. So if you change the size of the screen right here, 
So I'm just going to change the screen size. So let's go to the top. I'm just going to change the screen size and it's become, and it's got into the like a mobile, mobile version of the screen. So you can scroll it like what you do in a mobile phone. You can just scroll it like that. Uh, so this is, this is a tablet version and then it's the laptop version in which everything just gets uh, equally placed. So yeah, that's, that's how we, uh, that's how we do CSS and HTML. You can make a basic profile page and you can just display it and it will be like a fun project for your first year or in whichever grade you are right now. So I'm just gonna stop my share. I think we have actually crossed the limit for the time, but it's okay. Uh, I'm just gonna stop my share. Yeah, um, so yeah. thank you. Thank you, Arman, for that for that workshop. I personally learned a lot about like adding color and like color to the text and background and especially the grid. That was very interesting. Also like responsiveness. Uh, I think I'll have to like refresh myself on that. I can probably do my own research, but yeah, that was a very good introduction. So I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'll turn it over to Annie for the closing remarks now. Yeah, so before we do our closing remarks, we'll actually be conducting the prize draw. Um, so thank you for all your entries. And Ethan, are you going yeah, to share screen, me, please? Yes. Okay. So, Okay, so congrats to Victoria Chen. You are our first winner. And we're gonna do this a couple more times. And Emily Zhang, congratulations. And our third winner is Amina Rizwan. I'm please forgive me if I pronounced your name incorrectly. And our fourth winner is Teresa Yu. And finally, we have Leah and Miguel. Congratulations to all of you. PTC will be sending you guys additional information regarding your prizes. And on the behalf of PTC Vancouver, I would like to thank all of you for attending the second PTC Associated Conference for Youth in Vancouver. We hope you all had a great experience and that we can see each other again at our next conference, but hopefully meeting you all face-to-face -face rather than virtually. If you have any questions at all, feel free feel free to reach out to us out on Instagram at PTC Vancouver. And once again, thank you for taking the time to participate and visualize this.